Okay, welcome everybody to another Sunday session. It's been about a month since the last one. Uh, there was one there that I had to postpone on Colombia and Argentina. Try and reschedule that for later in the year. There's been kind of a few changes on that side of things. I have been talking with a couple of uh, petroleum engineers down there who gave me a lot of new information, which I didn't have the time to really build that one out and get it presented the way I wanted uh, at the time. So um, that that one will be rescheduled, but we're back here with a uh, Alaska-focused uh, oil and gas session on the history, the little bit around the current production, and then where the forecast is. And, and the reason why I really wanted to present this uh, was, was twofold. One is that I think in a structurally bullish commodity environment, that is a supply-focused cycle, a supply-driven cycle. Really what we need to watch for is where in the world can there be multi hundreds of uh, hundreds of thousands or millions possibly of barrels uh, come online? The reason, you know, the reason the Permian was so successful in bringing the price of oil down was not because the Permian is so prolific. It's it's because of the size of the Permian and it's so prolific. So really, when we look at kind of what can come online here in the next few years to meet our growing demand, to meet that growing thirst for energy. We're looking for fields that are that are much much bigger, uh, and can add add the barrels um, where where it really matters, and can really impact the supply not not just in the short term, but in uh, an area that can continue growing, and really end up impacting supply um, throughout for for many many years uh, for for many many years as the Permian Shale just did. So that's why I think last month I really wanted to present the offshore oil and gas um, overview so that. There was some understanding as to things to watch out for. And then now kind of more around where are the other parts of the world where we have seen massive, massive discoveries uh, that have so far, you know, maybe they've been produced already, but have seen relatively low exploration. So compared to something like the Middle East uh, and Saudi, where yes, we have big fields. Yes, we have the capacity to increase production massively, both onshore and offshore. It's just something that's been very, very well explored and delineated. So we have a good line of sight as to, okay, Aramco is going to do this till 2027. Uh, Iraq is going to do this. Iran's going to do this. Whereas the real, i uh, call it uh, a twist in the tail can come from these, these other areas where people aren't really watching. And then they add 10,000 barrels here and 20,000 here and 40,000 there. And then all of a sudden it becomes this snowball effect because you see more production, which means more infrastructure which means more pipelines, which means more data out there. And then companies can just harness that uh, and really increase production. So that's the first reason. And the second reason, um, as, as many of you may have seen, uh, I did invest in a Alaskan exploratory company uh, in my personal portfolio there, not a recommendation by any means, but I was getting so many questions as to sort of what, what was the reasoning behind that. So um, I think... Just want to share a little bit more on on that as well. Um, not not saying that that's the core reason for this, but uh, just something that I wanted to uh, myself learn more about as I follow these these uh, supply areas uh, moving forward. So a couple of housekeeping things up front. Uh, I'm not an investment advisor, so please everything here that I share today is my own opinion based on information uh, that I've gathered. And uh, if you are looking for any sort of assistance, please uh, talk to your uh, registered investment advisor. And also please check your portfolio construction. So the companies that are being discussed possibly in this presentation, uh, whether they're majors all the way down to the juniors, they may not fit your portfolio construction. So just because something has a expected risk reward on it, uh, each person's own ri um, uh, risk profile is different, your investment timeframes are different, and the portfolio construction will have to apply to those specific cases. And with that comes risk tolerance. So please check your risk tolerance. A, a, a lot of people think they have a lot of risk tolerance, but then the volatility comes and then there's this mass panic and, and sell-off um, that occurs because of that. So be honest with yourself. What, what kind of risk can you actually tolerate as far as downside risk? What sort of risk can you tolerate as far as longevity risk? So it's not just something will go down a bunch. It's that there's an opportunity cost to that. If something stagnates or stays there for a while, 
or the investment uh, time frame lengthens. Uh, all of these things have to be taken into account before you go and invest in in anything in the oil and gas industry. But in uh, in particular, some of the companies that are now being brought up uh, as the sessions continue. So we want this one today, and then we have a Petro Ninja Wells update uh, coming up next Sunday that will cover um, even more of the of some of the smaller companies and what they've been up to. Um, the other thing is I do have a mailing list now going on. So all I send out is a Zoom links and the files. Uh, if there are any applicable files. So if you do want to be on the Zoom uh, or sorry, the the mailing list, uh, shoot me an email or a DM. Uh, I am again a week or two behind on, on both of those. So I'm going to try and catch up here over the next little bit and uh, get people added who have sent me the uh, information, but I haven't got you on there yet. And both the Zoom and the Twitter space is recorded. Uh, the Zoom will obviously be on YouTube after the fact. Uh, YouTube has once again changed their algorithm and now they're uh, rendering videos very, very fast. So I'm hoping to get this out uh, right away as soon as we are done. And then the Twitter space will be on Twitter. Uh, all the other Zooms are recorded and on the YouTube channel. Um, so you can uh, feel free to uh, listen into them after the fact as well. A um, couple other things. If you are on the Twitter space, a quick reminder, and you would like to join for the Zoom, the visuals, uh, whitetundra.ca. If you scroll to the bottom under events, um, the the Zoom link is on there. You can join us for the visuals. If not, the audio works just fine uh, for now as well. And a couple other updates. The price targets on the website have been updated for Q4. So not only that, the few companies that have reported for Q1 have also been updated. So I'm working on that as I go. It's kind of a iterative process. There was a few changes made to the overall modeling um, because of the fact that some of the companies are seeing excessive operating cost increases, uh, despite the fact that WTI has not come down. So their operating costs went up last year as WTI was going up, and now the operating costs never came down, despite the fact that WTI is lower. So, so there is a certain adjustment that was made because of that. There was also an adjustment made because more companies are becoming cash taxable. So now that has to be incorporated into your overall forecast as to what the company can pay out, what their free cash flows are. So, so there were a few changes made uh, for Q4 2022. I'm gonna run with them for the next quarter or two and, and see how they pan out. And of course, always making changes as I go as well. Uh, but I guess from my perspective, I, I, I will share this, is that there is a change I think that's occurred in the cycle where it's become from from my perspective, more of a long-term investment at this point. So whether it's the small to mid caps, whether it's some of the bigger names uh, or whether it's some of the junior companies, I am now in a, in more of an investment mindset that this is gonna be a long cycle. It is going to be a higher for longer cycle. And I've picked my companies. I'm very happy with the companies. I don't need to go out and, and nitpick every single quarterly release from every company. Um, although I still read them, I don't I don't really follow up on them as much as I was 12, 18, 24 months ago. Uh, so so being all of that, just going to be a little bit less active um, on, on the Zoom sessions and on Twitter in general, but still uh, participate as much as I can to to keep the community going, to keep the information sharing going. And uh, the presentations will, will always keep going, I think, um, because it's just something that I enjoy and it's something that I do anyways. Uh, if I have some interest in a certain part of the sector, I will go and nerd out on it, uh, figure out a lot of information. And then I say, okay, well, while I'm doing this, why don't I just compile everything and then I can present it accordingly. So uh, similar to that point, this uh, presentation today will be more of a information-based session. So it will be an aggregation of what I've seen, what I've read, uh, the different kinds of information resource out there, uh, there's going to be very little for insight or for any conclusions being made. It's more so, hey, here's the data. Here's what it means. Here's what it looks like. And then people can make their own uh, subjective view on that uh, kind of going forward. And um, yeah, I think a lot of the sessions going forward will be like this, uh, given that we've covered some of the more insight focused sessions already. Uh, although, like I said, I do have the Petra Ninja Wells update coming up next week, which is pretty much insight uh, focused uh, entirely. So with that, I think we'll get started. Um...
don't have any other housekeeping items. So yeah. So we will begin with about 10 to 15 slides on macro. It's been about a month since I last presented. And also the quarterly sessions of the macro have now been turned into a semi-annual session. So given that we are exactly three months today from, I believe from when the last uh, macro session was done, I think it's a good time to go through 10, 15, 20 slides and just share some of the major, major keys uh, that I've been focusing on. I've mentioned these before. There's there's only a few major factors in 2023 that are really key to the overall global supply demand. One being jet fuel and international jet travel. So here we see the number of scheduled seats. We see a very nice recovery looking like we're getting closer and closer to 2019. So, so not only are we growing, but the Delta between 2019 and 2023 is getting closer and closer with pretty much bang on in the next two to three weeks, uh, we should hit 2020, uh, 2019 capacity for the uh, number of seats that are available globally uh, to travel by, by, by air. And the one interesting thing here is, look at the recovery compared to 2022. So, you know, we can argue all we want that is there a recession happening or not? Well, if, if there's a recession happening, but the world wasn't fully reopened in, in, in 2022. You, you have to take those two factors into account. You can't just say there's going to be a recession happening from a time when we weren't even fully open. That, that argument doesn't hold weight because the data is right here. We are having 20% more, 20 to 25% more uh, seats available uh, right now as we speak for international and domestic jet travel. So these things don't occur in a recession. Um, and it and it's why this year is is very very important. It's very interesting to not just run with one narrative. You have to look at everything uh, as far as the impact of it and everything compared to where we were uh, last year as well. People will be very surprised to hear that 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 a flight flight schedules such as New York to Rome or San Francisco to London, uh, maybe not those exact cities, but any of these sorts of uh, uh, flight paths are up 60 to 80% compared to last year. These things don't happen in a Euro European recession. These things don't happen in an American recession. So just be careful of the definition uh, that people are trying to place on the word recession. And what does that mean for a petroleum consumption standpoint? Uh, you'll find that that comparing this to any other cycle may or may not make sense. I'll sort of leave that up to you. Uh, but the data shows the recovery is on and we're looking pretty good so far. I would not be surprised personally because I track the new flights that are being uh, announced, any new flight routes that are not in the scheduled data to see this, this, this 2023 number uh, cross the 2019 line by the end of May or so uh, in the next month. It's, it's going to be very interesting to see, do we just maintain this or do we actually get more flights added and we end up surpassing this um, as we go. Capacity versus region. So not, not only should we be looking at the overall global capacity, we should be looking at things by region. So you can see Latin America is showing exceptional growth uh, compared to pre-COVID uh, pre levels in 2019. Uh, we're seeing Africa, not, not a huge market, but still uh, rising. We see Europe really, really lagging here. And one that, that we really need uh, some more response from from the European um, travel industry to to keep these up. Uh, one of the big reasons, as I mentioned last month, was they were allowed to not book all their uh, reserved um, what do you call them uh, uh, reserved slots that the airlines had this year. They have to book them, so we should see continued recovery in that. Uh, Middle East is looking good. North America, pretty much where it was, slight growth, and then really. Uh, it's your Asian market that's showing the massive increase here and should continue to rise. I mean, we don't have good clarity on these flight schedules more than four to six weeks out. Those those schedules are more with an asterisk on it. So if you look at the pace of recovery in Asia, we still have a lot to recover here that's already baked in uh, into the flight schedules and then maybe a little bit more on top of that. So this is all something that's happening as we go. These things don't just happen overnight where, okay, we're going to hire 2,000 pilots 
and get all these flights going again. It it just doesn't work like that. The real world is is not a Sims game uh, where you just press a button and then all of a sudden everything's done. So things move slowly. Uh, there's there's a process to everything. And really what we need to see is a continued process that's evolving and increasing petroleum consumption, which is where we are right now. Another, <clears throat> excuse me, another factor that I think has gotten a bit out of hand is, is the talk about business travel never coming back. So we look at year versus 2019, the variance in summer of 21, business travel was down 60% versus uh, 2019, uh, leisure travel was down 40%. Okay, so business travel was lagging. At some point in the summer of 2022, where summer is when you have the most flights, no matter what, the uh, business travel was only down 30% and leisure travel was down 27%. So you saw business travel really recover a lot more than people were expecting. And now where we are today, uh, leisure travel is down about 15% and business travel is down about 25%. So it is continually recovering. There is nothing that can make up for a handshake and a face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball meeting. You can say, you know, do Zooms all you want. I can sit here and do these Zooms and I can get the point across. But when it comes to true business relationships, and deals being signed, you have to have that in-person, um, call it, uh, meeting. And then the same with conferences. There's a lot of conferences that were virtual and are seeing their the number of people attending completely drop. Like nobody wants to attend these uh, virtual conferences anymore. They want to go travel somewhere, whether it's on their dime or the company's dime, and go and meet people um, and... Uh, have a have a chat in person in real life. So um, definitely one to, to keep an eye for. The narrative around business travel has definitely been very bearish, but looks like things have recovered and are continuing to recover. Um, there's a comment here that the slides are at, on a thousand percent Zoom. Is, is that for anybody else or are they good uh, on your end? So somebody can just comment there. Uh, the other thing, when we look at the travel coming out of China, so, okay, okay, so the slides are good. So what happens when a company or when a country shuts down for three years and then reopens? A country that is as risk averse as China, people there do not take risks, whether it's health-wise, whether it's business-wise, whether it's employment, whatever. So after three years of a virus and a lockdown, who's gonna come out and travel first? Well, we have the data. In 2019, 27% of travel was from singles. 2023, 38%. Couples were 23%. Now they're 27%. So singles and couples without kids were the first ones to get out and about. Families, 24% to 24%. Exact same. So they, they haven't really ramped up. They haven't done their pent up demand. They just are where they are. And then group travel. Group travel is massive in China, in Hong Kong, in Asia, in Japan. They go in these groups. They will have a predetermined route. They will have their meals planned out. People like the ease of these sorts of travels, especially some of the older population within China. They don't want to plan all these things. And group travel is down from being 26% of the overall travel to 11%. And why is that important? Because the groups are just starting. They're just starting there's a lot of issues getting these groups off the ground when you had different vaccination policies, you had different testing policies. It's a lot easier for singles and couples to travel rather than groups. So now that that's uh, getting fixed, you'll see more of this. And then the other reason group travel is so important is because obviously one group is gonna be 50, 60, 100 people, whereas a single or a couple traveling is one or two people. So. One, one or two travel groups could take up entire airline and then three buses and then all the Ubers and the motorcycles and everything else. It's, it's a much larger impact once that group travel starts. So it's, it's all coming. It's all working. It's all going to happen slowly, slowly, slowly. Um, the people that are saying that Chinese reopening has fizzled out and it's finished. I could give you an example. Every single week or even every single day where a new flight is getting restarted that has been shut in since pre-COVID. So something like a New Zealand 
to China, something like a Japan to Hong Kong or Australia, whatever, any of these flights that are starting for the first time since pre-COVID, if they're still occurring on a daily and a weekly basis, how can we come here and say that the reopening is done, right? So, so just think about that. And for, and for anyone that wants to track that, uh, simpleflying.com. They post 20, 40, 60 news articles every day on every single new uh, flight route along with some other information as well. But I'm I'm really only focused on the ones uh, on the new, the new flight routes uh, that are being started and how many times a day. And you can run the jet fuel consumption numbers on them if you really want. Uh, but, but some of these flights are like, okay, if this gets started, we're adding 600 barrels a day to global uh, international jet fuel demand. And I see those two to three to four times a day, those sorts of announcements. So what does it mean um, as we go on here into the summer? Okay, so enough on the flights. I think the international flights are definitely one to track if you're looking for the health of the global economy plus overall uh, accrued, or sorry, overall products consumption in the world. You have to track international jet fuel uh, going forward. And, and, and the way we do that is through the scheduled seat capacity into the future. We, we, are, we already have this information. Um, the next one I'll talk about is the Chinese imports. So as many of you know, March was an all-time high in Chinese crude imports, about 11.2, I want to say, uh, million barrels per day. Before that, we had January at about 9.1. Uh, this is all according to Vortexa data. And then February was about 9.9. .9. Uh, April, we have come down. We are back to the February level of 9.9. .9. But you can see what's, what's really happened. There was one week in early February or in early April that really screwed up the data. Other than this, we're still on trend. If you average out these two bars here, the last week of March with the first week of April, we are roughly at the same level as we have been for the last six to eight weeks. So looking good. I will continue to track this uh, moving forward week by week by week, almost on a daily level. Um, and just and just keep seeing what, what China's importing and then compare that to their inventory level, which tells you roughly uh, what they're finding. And then you compare that to their product uh, inventories. It tells you what their internal consumption is. And things so far are looking quite good uh, on that end. For those that are following the May uh, May Day China Week holidays, the domestic travel, including flights and rail, is up 20% versus 2019. So never mind recovery. We're 20% above 2019. And China is still not re even really fully open uh, to the outside world yet. They just took the PCR test requirement off yesterday. So as these things happen, it's just more and more demand that slowly gets added. You don't want an influx and then hotel prices are 10X. Nobody can afford anything. It doesn't make any sense. So doing things in a staged manner uh, is just better. And that seems to be the way uh, that China and Hong Kong and Japan uh, are doing these things. I talked about China uh, PCR requirement. Japan just ended their uh, vaccination and pre uh, a, a pre arrival COVID test requirement on the 28th. They are ending all COVID travel policies on May 8th. These things make a difference in the way that people book travel and the way that people do do end up traveling uh, and who can travel as well. Russian seaborne exports of crude, the third major factor to watch. We are seeing not, not much happening. It's basically flatlined. We have the 1st to 23rd of April is down about 200,000 barrels per day compared to last month. Is it meaningful enough to really make a conclusion? Not really. Um, we would like to see this go further down if you really want to make a meaningful conclusion. Until then, we're basically stuck here. Um, just keep in mind that since the beginning of 2022, the Russian pipeline exports have gotten a lot lower. So especially through the uh, Druzba pipeline that goes into Europe. So if they're exporting less through pipeline and their seaborne crude exports stay the same, their overall exports are still down. It just doesn't show up in the most transparent data source that we're looking at. So just something to keep in mind when people are running this 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 narrative, which is true, it's based on data that the seaborne export hasn't really dropped. Well, 
Russia doesn't just export through seaborne. They also ex uh, export through pipelines. And that pipeline flow has gone a lot lower. Um, so just something to keep in mind, Russian consumption is also very seasonal, internal consumption. So uh, as the summer comes in, their consumption does go up and it'll be interesting to see uh, whether this drops further or whether it continues to stay here um, as the summer continues. US rig count, this is your fourth major factor and one that is extremely shocking to me how few people are discussing this. You know, we say, okay, oil price is down from 120 to 75, um, demand is is whatever, supply is whatever, and that means that the oil market is, is collapsed. Okay, so what happens when the price of oil drops from 120 to 75 and the crack spread is down from $60 a barrel to $30 a barrel? Two things happen. One, demand goes up. If you're paying 550 a gallon at the gas pump versus you're paying 450 a gallon at the gas pump, you may end up traveling more. You may end up doing random drives just because you want to drive, uh, as is the American culture. So there is a demand component to it. But the second component that's even more interesting is the supply component, which is US rigs are down, according to Inverus, over 100 rigs since October. So what happens when you drop a rig? You, you don't feel that impact right away. You feel that impact in three months because in three months, there, there's now three wells that haven't come online, three to five wells because of that rig. In six months, there's now seven to 10 wells that haven't come online because of that rig. A year down the road, there's now 20, 15 to 20 wells that haven't come online because that rig was dropped. So it's a compounding effect of this rig drop that is going to show up in US production. So throughout last year, we were seeing rigs continually getting added as the year went on, which meant if you put a six month leg on it, production was gonna increase. Well, what's a six month leg from October 10th? It's right where we are today. So the impact of this is gonna be felt because not only did rig count drop, it has continued dropping week by week by week by week. And last I saw, we were down over hundred rigs um, so we'll see the impact of this as time goes on. Keep in mind, these rigs are being dropped while the DUC count now does not exist. So last year, beginning of 2022, they had a bunch of Permian DUCs uh, along with DUCs grilled uncompleted wells in other parts uh, of the US where, okay, the rig count is still catching up. We'll just frack and get these wells online. Well, we don't have that luxury anymore. So for people that are kind of wondering well, how come shale production continues to increase or, or hasn't dropped? It's not just going to drop right away. The fact that we've gone from an era of growing one to one and a half million barrels per day to U.S. production is relatively flat for the last six months. And now we have this lag effect um, of the rig counts being dropped. You can kind of see why, why nothing operates in a vacuum. You can't just say, oh, if the oil price is here, then it's just going to stay here because the rigs are being dropped. And that plays in shale, in unconventional shale, high decline, that plays a major impact uh, going forward on both gas and oil. So a very interesting factor to watch. I would, I would keep an eye out on Permian production and Eagleford and Bakken production from the, call it May to September to December period as to what the impact of this is um, as, as time goes on, and whether the rig count continues to drop. If we see another 50 rigs lost in the next four, six, eight, 10 weeks, it just becomes a bigger and bigger and bigger problem, which is then harder to fix because we're already in a physically undersupplied market. And when that demand kicks on, well, if you don't have supply and if shale isn't willing to come online, now, now we get to a very interesting point uh, in the oil cycle back to almost where we were in, in 2012 to 2014, um, where it was pretty certain that prices were going to stay higher for longer uh, until shale came on the scene. So just want to think about, these are kind of the main, the main data points that we need to track. As I mentioned, I've taken a more of a hands-off approach on the companies, focusing more on the main data points, and things are coming along as, as they were. The longer oil price stays under 80, 85, $90 a barrel, the more problems we have in terms of supply one, two, three, five years down the road.
And backing all that up is the crude inventories. So we now have nine straight weeks of onshore crude inventory draw. Uh, we have 11 out of the last 13 weeks are crude uh, onshore crude inventory draws. All of this has occurred despite in the last 13 weeks, Vertexa has, uh, has been tracking 100 million more barrels of tank capacity. So we're seeing these draws and Vertexa has uh, has added 100 million more of tank capacity. Historically, tanks have run within the Vertexa system at about 50% full, 50 to 55% full. So not only did we see these draws, but they effectively added 50 to 60 million barrels of new tankage um, that is not reflected in these onshore crude draws. So the problem is bigger than this graph makes it seem. And this graph already shows a pretty significant undersupplied market uh, as we are. On top of that, floating storage is down 40 to 50 million barrels in the last three to four weeks. A lot of that came from China. China had for some reason stockpiled a lot of inventory at the end of March. I think it had to do with their imports. They were importing so much oil at the end of March, uh, as I've shown in the earlier graph, that they weren't able to import it all. And they had this floating storage that popped up that has now dwindled down, as well as France. France had 18 to 19 million barrels uh, of crude end up on their ports while the port strike was going on. And now they're down to about five to six. So a lot of that storage has come back on, uh, on shore. And yet we still drew onshore crude the last two, three, four weeks. Uh, in fact, three weeks ago was almost 2 million barrels uh, a day of crude draw, despite the floating storage coming down as it was. So those are kind of the, the four to five factors there. And then you have the refining complex. So we look at US crack spreads. There's a bit of panic going on that the crack spread has come down from $40 a barrel to $30 a barrel. Zoom out a bit. $30 a barrel is higher than it's been in the last 10 years. Other than 2022, it's still higher than it's been in the last 10 years. So crack spreads typically are in the $15 to $20 range when you have ample refining capacity. Um, why did this happen in 2022? I will discuss it here in the next couple of slides. But when you, have, when you go from an oversupplied refining market to an undersupplied refining market, that the marginal barrel is going to get bid up and you are going to see crack spreads skyrocket and then normalize as refining capacity comes online. And we're still doing pretty decent. Would I like to uh, see this stay above $25 a barrel? Yes, for sure. It shows you that, okay, demand is still really good in one sense, but also that the refining, uh, the refining complex is still making money. We don't want to bring it too far down uh, where they end up doing long maintenance and they and they stop refining so that the crack spread goes up and they make more money, aka the whole price gouging uh, issue that was happening uh, in mid-2022. So looking pretty good still. Whenever you see something quote-unquote collapse, always try and compare it to where they were and did it, and did it have a massive spike before it quote-unquote collapsed. So still looking pretty good here. And why did 2022 happen? Because look at this graph, global refining capacity. Every year it went up very, very close to oil production levels. We kept getting more refineries being added. And then bang, in 2020, we saw our first contraction. In 2021, we saw another contraction in global refining capacity. And 2022 was roughly even. So we went from a oversupplied refining market to not having enough refining capacity, especially as OPEC was reducing uh, their cuts in 2022 and adding more barrels every single month. The refining capacity just couldn't keep up and there was way too much product being consumed um, and we didn't have the refining capacity. So it's not hard to see when you look at this graph and you compare it to this graph, why the crack spread blew out and why it's now coming down is right here. Look at 2023 changes in distillation capacity. You have closures of about 200 to 300,000 barrels per day, and you have new new um, refining and expansions of two and a half million barrels per day. So we are effectively adding 2 million barrels per day plus of refining capacity in 2023, which is why the crack spreads is coming down more so than it has to do with a straight statement on 
demand is collapsing. That that's not that's not the way. Uh, the conclusion that can be made once you look deeper and understand why the crack spread went up and why the crack spread is coming down. Here is another uh, chart that just backs that up. So this is uh, net oil refining capacity. So 2023 and 2024, we see large jumps in refining capacity. Uh, 2021 and 2020 were relatively low. And I think this graph doesn't even look uh, correct. It's look, it looks like it's missing some of the of the uh, permanent closures that happened uh, in 2020 and 2021. But you can see with these massive increases in refining capacity, obviously the crack spread is going to come down. When you when you have more supply of something at the same demand level, you still get a contraction uh, in the crack spread. So, um, yes, yeah, yeah. And the other thing that energy blogger just has uh, put in the chat is India and China are able to produce their, uh, their refined product much cheaper than Russia. Um, so, so there is that, that comes in as well. That's bringing the crack spread down, but just keep in mind when you have refining capacity increase, it's always going to bring crack spread down, even if demand rises. Uh, so we cannot make a statement on demand strictly looking at crack spreads anymore. Uh, like we were in 2022. And the average cracking net back margin. So I've seen some interesting posts on Twitter, uh, especially with European and Asian gas oil uh, refining, Singapore especially, that we are coming back down and, and, and there's a problem here. We're back down to pre-COVID levels. Well, pre-COVID level refining cracks weren't that great. Mediterranean, $5 to $10 a barrel. Northwest Europe, $5 to $10 a barrel. Singapore, Five to ten dollars a barrel. U.S. Atlantic Coast, five to fifteen dollars a barrel. U.S. Gulf Coast, ten to ten to fifteen dollars a barrel. So, refining crack spreads coming down from forty to thirty, being used as an indicator of very very poor demand, completely wrong, because we used to be in a five to ten to fifteen dollar crack spread. Uh, environment for many, many, many years. And that's what people used to run at. So if you look at the blue line, that's 2023, we're still much higher than we were back then. Part of it is that we are still in an undersupplied product market. Some of the product inventories are still a lot lower uh, where we don't have that buffer zone. Uh, and then also demand continues to rise and look stronger. So we're seeing general strength compared to, you can't just compare it to a undersupplied refining market in 2022. Go back and compare it to 2019 compared to 2014, compared to 2010. And you'll see why we're still looking very good uh, on the demand side. And here is a few more graphs that back it up. So get, uh, ice gas oil versus Brent, gas oil being diesel coming down, but still relatively healthy. Uh, a European naphtha within the range. Uh, NYMEX gasoline in the US, still looking very, very good. Uh, Singapore fuel oil is the one that has suffered uh, just because of excess residuals and heavy oil that's come out of Russia uh, and the Middle East. When OPEC fully unwound their cuts, that heavy sour came out. Uh, we also had 150 or so million barrels of uh, heavy or sorry, of sour barrels that came out of the SPR that ended up on the market. So all that now has to be taken in and absorbed, which it is getting absorbed as as time goes on here. Okay, I got a few more on the macro and then and then we'll go uh, into the actual session. So the, the financial markets for oil, this is something that's been mentioned many, many times, uh, but we look at Brent, managed positioning is down almost 60%. WTI, managed positioning, positioning is down 50%. Uh, we see gas oil, diesel, positioning is net short for only the third time in the last seven years. This is from uh, Ole, uh, Ole Hansen, on Twitter, he posts these graphs. Um, so the financial market has completely given up on these products uh, and crude, which brings the overall price down. So what happens when, when the price of diesel comes down on the financial markets, the crack spreads come down. So just be careful what conclusion you're making or, or the conclusion that people are making from a certain data point. I think the conclusion on diesel coming down has been very misleading uh, over the last uh, couple of months. 
And that's why on my Twitter feed, I posted that global distillate demand by, by, uh, by continent chart. Cause I just got sick of this, this, this narrative that diesel demand is going down with no data to back it up, except oh, the crack spread is coming down, meaning diesel uh, consumption must be lower. Completely wrong conclusion to make. That 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 could be the conclusion, but without the data and and the other factors baked into that, uh, in this case, that was the wrong conclusion to make. Uh, in fact, completely wrong. Uh, so so yeah, we we will follow this as we go on. Will the gas oil crack uh, crack or will the gas oil uh, money positioning come back up and help that? Uh, will there be some uh, refining problems that also help uh, that that uh, crack spread normalize? Or are we just in a oversupplied refining market again going forward, which as a ENP investor is a perfect place to be? Uh, gasoline as well, a little bit lower managed money positioning here. And then New York Harbor, uh, ultra low sulfur diesel, also looking quite low here compared to uh, the last couple of years. US refining capacity, same thing. When we look at percent utilization, we are in our summer season. So we have gone through the spring maintenance and turnarounds. We're now running up. Historically, we've been in the 94 to 96% range come June June 1st. We are now at 91.5%. So still uh, about a million barrels plus of US refining capacity still to come online. You can see why that crack spread continues to drop if we keep refining more and more and more and a lot of refining capacity that came online in the first half of this year, and then coming off turnaround here over the next three to six weeks. This is OPEC exports minus Russia. So OPEC plus exports, crude exports, seaborne minus Russia, very stable. The level from January to February to March to April is almost the same. The reason you see the bars deviate is because of different uh, number of days in each month. And, and, and this April graph was taken on the 27th. So once you normalize this, OPEC has produced exactly what they said they would do. Despite WTI coming down and staying down, the game theory has not played out where each producer is just gonna jack up production to make up for revenue. And like this, this, this theme that I continue, he uh, continue to keep hearing, it hasn't happened. So if you think that's gonna happen, show me the data where OPEC or any country uh, in OPEC has overproduced since they had their OPEC cuts mandated. You're not going to find it. So a very cohesive unit. And as they go on here, uh, May 1st, tomorrow, the supposed OPEC cuts are going to be implemented. One that I'm going to be tracking daily. I will be tracking this graph on the daily, seeing what's changed. Of course, there's going to be a lag period to that, uh, but I will track it. And as soon as there's a step change, uh, we will notice it. And maybe a opportunity to be more and more confident uh, in the ENP holdings at that point in time. Never forget the SPR release. So whatever you do, whenever you're looking at oil markets, don't forget that 250 million barrels was released last year. Whether you wanna call it supply, whether you wanna call it inventory, whether you think it's gonna be refilled or not, doesn't, doesn't really matter. Don't forget that the US released 250 million barrels from the SPR to control oil markets last year. They don't have that ammo anymore. Are they releasing another 26 here? Sure, keep on dumping them. You, you don't have 250 to release. And the market is not looking any better based on the previous graphs I've shown here. Demand looks like it continues to go up. Supply, especially in shale, may have been permanently damaged here once again uh, as we go on as, as seen in the rig count activity. Um, the company's health themselves, you can see the free cash flow in green, negative in 15, in 16, in 2017, in 2018, in 2019, in 2020. And now we get this huge ramp up in free cash flow. CapEx hasn't really gone up. Dividends and, and share repurchases have gone up. And even though they're down now in uh, 1Q23, uh, or sorry, in Q4 of 22, we're still looking quite good here in terms of the company's health, in terms of what they're doing with their free cash flow, and in terms of capital discipline. Still looks relatively good. 
a lot of this, as you know, came from capital or uh, capital inflation. So when you have inflation running at 15 to 20%, you are going to see increase in CapEx for the exact same work being done. So just always keep this in mind is the, the company that is a supposedly the worst balance sheet today in the Canadian ENP space or the US ENP space would have been middle of the pack in 2014 or in 2013. And the, the, the companies that were going to go under or get bought out have already gone under or gone bought out. The companies that have survived five to six years of $50 oil from 2015 to 2020, the ones that survived the COVID crash, they're the ones that made it. That like these are your your it's almost like saying this is your 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 lowest quality US Navy SEAL. It's still a US Navy SEAL. So they will still rip apart anybody who who tries and mess with them. So just keep these things in mind. We we have this short termism. We get stuck in these thinkings that you know, these companies are high risk. They are not doing things properly. Their balance sheet doesn't look good. Go back, look at corporate presentations from 2013, 2016, 2018, and realize what you're buying uh, now is, is the best of the best, uh, is the worst of the best of the best. So good place to be. Uh, and then one final chart on this. Uh, I've got a lot of interesting uh, accounts on Twitter that continue to post bearish narratives and take credit for the last few months. And they say, Hey, you know, you're, you're, a, you're stupid. You're so dumb that you didn't sell uh, at the peak in 2022. Like, you know, what were you thinking? How could you do this? Uh, and be very careful. These same accounts were supposedly shorting oil in February of 2022, right there. From February 10th of 2022, when I screenshotted this, because I thought this was the dumbest thing to do, to March 7th, WTI went up $30 a barrel. And this account was supposedly short at the time. And this account continues to target me specifically and post uh, interesting comments about you were wrong and, and how did this happen and take credit for calling the collapse. The reality is bears will just keep calling the oil price to go down. If they're wrong, hey, whatever, no responsibility needs to be taken. If they're right, now the showboating starts. Whereas on the bull side, we take responsibility when we say oil price is going higher and it doesn't. We now need to take responsibility for that every single time. It's just the way human nature works. It's just the way the market works. When you say something is going to happen positive and it doesn't happen, you do get called out. When you say something positive is not going to happen and it does happen, you don't need to take responsibility. So just be very careful at, at giving people credit for calling the downturn or that the prices come down because these people made no money from this point here in 2020 all the way up. And then they were possibly shorting, trying to short oil as it continued to rise and that short blew up in their face. And then they had no money to make on the way down. So bulls make money bears claim victory and seem like they're right. Um, I'm very happy with my uh, portfolio performance from, from this point right here to this point right here, and even from this point right here to this point right here. Um, it's been fantastic. So uh, that's why I remain an optimist, especially when it's backed up by data. Um, and I don't care for people that continue to berate uh, the negative side of things because they've been saying the same thing. They said the same thing here and here and here and here and here. They were wrong 10 times in a row. Now they're right once. Big deal. I'm I'm sitting here in my money bags, enjoying life. So with that, uh, we will get to our Alaska focus session. So we're going to do, we're going to start with the history, a little bit on the background of where Alaska was, uh, where the oil came from. We'll talk about a little bit about the production right now what companies are involved, and then we'll look at the uh, future forecast, because that is one of the most important things, is to look at what are the new projects coming online. I shared this in my offshore session, is you can literally track every single well offshore that's an exploration well. You can track every single well that's a development well. You can track any FIDs being done, final investment decisions. 
you can look at any FPSOs that are moving to site. So once the uh, floating production and uh, storage platform gets built, they then have to transport it to its final position. You can see that, you can track that. Not just in real time, you can track that into the future. So you can see, okay, these are the exploratory wells that are gonna happen in the next two to three to four years or the next couple of quarters and have a really good idea of where the supply is gonna come from. And if any of those wells hit some massive discovery like Guyana or something in Namibia, that tells you, okay, my attention now needs to be focused on these areas, which can create a problem on the supply, the supply side thesis. So I will share the same for Alaska. We can track every new project. We can track every new well and the production results of that. So before, like, let's just say there's some really good results coming out. Before Alaska can add a million barrels per day, they need to go and drill wells and build facilities and build whatever else. And we'll get a really good line of sight into that. Um, if, if all you got to do is just track these few things and it makes me sleep a lot better because I know, okay, these are the areas where supply can come online and nothing looks to be coming online in the very, very near term. And I will continue to track the longer term for any major shifts um, as time goes on. So a little bit of history on the state itself. Alaska uh, became a state in 1959. Uh, they got a, a state selection of the oil potential in the 1960s, did a lot of exploration in the 1960s. Remember, this is way up north in the winter uh, tundra climates, and they were doing a lot of work through helicopters. There's only a limited exploration months that you can do it. Very expensive. Uh, only certain companies can do it. Uh, but obviously, we have seen that in 1968, the Prudhoe Bay oil field was discovered. And why is the Prudhoe Bay oil field so important? It is North America's biggest onshore a conventional oil field. So this oil field has produced about 14 to 18 billion barrels already. And there is still producing at about 300,000 barrels per day today. Could possibly be another four to 5 billion barrels of oil produced and another 5 billion barrels on top of that, uh, that, that is still under reserves or, or sorry, that is still under unrecoverable resource. Maybe technologies change maybe some sort of new injection works. And you have this huge field with infrastructure already in place uh, that is now operated by Hillcorp, which is a very gung-ho uh, run company, very, very wild west run company uh, who, who does have the financial capability and also the operation, um, call it the, the operational mindset to go and do these sorts of projects. Um, you know, if anybody's sort of really interested in a in a American oil company, Hillcorp is really fascinating. Uh, it's the one company. If if people remember a couple of years ago, during the depths of COVID, they were giving their employees a hundred thousand dollars bonuses. Each employee got that. Um, yeah, maybe it was two or three years ago, something like that, and it made the news. Um, and then once this oil field was discovered, because of its remoteness, we needed a pipeline. So the TAPS pipeline, Trans-Alaska Pipeline System, was construction was started in 1974. It's about a 900 mile pipeline, goes from the top of Alaska to the bottom of Alaska, roughly. In three years, it was completed. I'll share a little bit more information on this pipeline, a very interesting project, um, a little bit further on in the, in the uh, presentation. It effectively goes from the North Slope all the way to Valdez, uh, which is at the bottom of Alaska, where you can get oil out, shipping routes, LNG routes, crude oil routes, et cetera. And 1978 was when production skyrocketed. This pipeline was built to handle two plus million barrels per day. Think about that. This project to handle two plus million barrels per day of oil in a wintry Arctic tundra where there was nothing existing was built in roughly two and a half years and, and uh, and made operational. Compare that to some of the pipelines that are being built today and the issues we have with them and why it, uh, even if we discovered a field somewhere up there, 
uh, or somewhere else that could produce, let's say up way up in Canada somewhere that could produce a million barrels per day, it would take 20 years to get a pipeline built, which is why people are not so concerned about Canadian oil um, and the supply that it could add. So in the 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, you could get these projects built in record time. Now everything gets delayed before it's even built. You have four to five to 10 years of envi uh, environmental problems. Keep in mind, the Keystone Excel system was first uh, started to be discussed in 08, 09, somewhere around there. And it was finally kiboshed in 2020. 11 years and they couldn't get the thing built. Um, so when we look at where is the price of oil going to go in the future, always keep supply chain in mind. There, there is a real world uh, delay that's now into any project of this sort, especially on any oil project and especially on any oil pipeline project uh, of this size uh, moving forward. Uh, do, do, yeah. So there's a comment here that TAPS was built because the ocean freezes in Prudhoe Bay, so you can't get tankers up there in the winter. Yep, yep, great point. So I'll I'll show some more maps here as we go. Like this is just the first slide. So, uh, but I do appreciate the uh, comment for sure. So once the TAP system was built, 1978, we saw significant north slope production being added. Um, obviously, once the pipeline was built, the production came online. 1980s to today, we see continued exploration and development of new but smaller fields. I will discuss this as well as we go on. And 1988 was the peak. We peaked out at about 2 million barrels per day um, out of the North Slope. And then we had a big oil spill. In 1989, a tanker ran aground. I will also discuss this as we go on. And we had the Exxon Valdez oil spill. Uh, almost 200 plus thousand, I want to say, barrels that got spilled. Uh, very disastrous for not just the environment in the area, but for the overall reputation of the oil industry. A lot of changes have been made since then to prevent these sorts of things happening. And in 2011, the North Slope production was down to 600,000 barrels per day. Conventional oil, not, not really high decline, but it still declines. And as we speak today, um, Alaska oil production is roughly 450,000 barrels today. Uh, as we speak. So you can see the big change, step change that's occurred. Uh, just to put that into perspective, in 1988, Alaska was 25% of US oil production. Today, it's about 4% of US oil production. Alaskan oil revenues. The red bars are your oil revenues. So how much revenue is the state of Alaska getting from oil, uh, oil specifically? And then the share of revenues. Look at the percentage. Oil has been above 80% of Alaskan state revenue for the last 40 years. So this area, it's only got 750,000 people live in Alaska. That's it. And 90% of the revenue is coming from oil. Alaska has no state income tax and has no state sales tax. For people who live in other oil jurisdictions, uh, with, with with relatively low populations and a huge oil production, you can see why people are are maybe not as happy with the way uh, oil revenue is handled, um, especially with the taxation system on top of that um, that the public has to face. So uh, definitely want to think about Alaska has done exceptionally well. They also have a a small smaller fund, not as big as Norway, that they keep um, in terms of investments. And funnily enough, that if I'm if I'm understanding this correctly. That fund made over a billion dollars in 2022 um, and 2020, well, 2021, because it was invested in uh, equities uh, the, that were oil focused. And I may be misunderstanding that based on what I read. Now I'm just kind of trying to remember that uh, this from a couple of months ago when I first started looking into Alaska. But uh, I seem to remember that their investment income jacked up because they had that money and they invested it properly. So this is Alaska in. Not entirely sure when, maybe the 1960s, uh, 1970s. You can see it's a barren wasteland. Uh, this must be kind of in 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 springtime or in fall time. You can see the thawing of the ice and a rig <laughs> in in the mud, literally. And uh, yeah, this this was how it all started. This is how this is why the oil patch is is such a fascinating passion to me, 
the the exploratory spirit that people have in in the oil and gas world is unlike any other uh going out there with with no certainty of success spending millions and millions of dollars uh working 24/7 in order to produce oil and yet we're killing the world and polluting the planet um doesn't quite make sense so what what tipped them off that there was something here natural oil seeps similar to what happens in the Athabasca River in Fort McMurray we had natural oil seeps in Alaska where the US Navy went up there and they said well hang on a sec there 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 looks like a lot of oil seep here which means we must have a lot of oil uh, going around and so what they did they put some of Alaska as a NPR national petroleum reserve so a lot of people don't know this not only does the us have strategic petroleum reserves which are actual oil in caverns they have a national petroleum reserve where they say okay we have oil here we're going to take this land as our own and we're going to use it when we need it in the future for exploration and more development which is very interesting because we just have our first uh a uh, first major project in the national petroleum reserve got approved the of course the uh, conoco willow project which i will discuss in great detail as we go on but what does it tell you when the us uh, producers are now going into the national petroleum reserve and looking at exploration and development what does it tell you about the state of the rest of the us's reserves in the lower 48 and the fact that the us has this massive land package taken as a national petroleum reserve you got to think they're pretty confident there's a lot of oil here and why i'm doing this presentation today because there is thematic things that go along with the production side of things as the decade progresses uh, as to why i'm so focused on alaska as a as a growth a potential growth area um of course if the environmentalists don't get their way 1963 this is alaska you see the little uh i don't know what you call them these 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 tiny little helicopters that people would come out in they would live in these little shacks the geologists would would live in this shack they'd go and do sampling and testing and try and find the best places to drill um explore explorationists at heart today's cookie cutter shale well drilling you can see why why oil people don't think that's real oil oil development because it's not it it's just a one after one after one after one batch drilling doesn't quite speak to the passion of of what the oil industry used to be not saying there's anything wrong with it uh there is just a the definition of oil men uh has changed dramatically uh in the last 20 30 40 years here is a little bit more about alaska oil production you can see very low production 1977 1978 as soon as the taps came online wha bam we got 1.5 million barrels per day added in 2 years so this has happened before these these things do happen when 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 you have deposits like this you can increase production massively that's what happened throughout the 70s literally worldwide uh and then in the 60s in in the middle east obviously and then in the 80s as well uh with some of these discoveries but The way to look at this is when we say all the easy oil is gone we truly mean all the easy oil is gone. This this type of production profile on a conventional oil field you may never see again. In fact, you you likely will never see again this type of production profile on any conventional oil field whether it's offshore uh, onshore doesn't doesn't really matter. 1.5 million barrels increase in 2 years amazing. and to stay there and continue increasing for the next few years absolutely phenomenal uh the alaskan oil industry was was uh employing over 200,000 people back then in the 80s i'm assuming the alaskan population was a lot lower back then so a significant amount of alaska came from oil and today it still is oil here are 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 some of the units so this is up here in the prudhoe bay unit We have our Kuparuk River unit now owned by Conoco. We also have the Milne Point unit which is now defunct. Doesn't doesn't operate anymore. Uh zero barrels. 
as far as I know. And then you also have, when you look at the some of the areas in the Cook Inlet, which I will share more maps as we go, uh, there is other oil sources within the inlet as well. Uh, obviously, you don't want to be drilling within your your uh, 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 a trade route and your shipping route. So not as uh, productive, but they were still drilled back then. And I will share a little bit more on the on the Cook Inlet um, as we uh, as we sort of go on. So there's a comment here that that Mill Point is being operated by Hill Corp. Okay, so so there is some uh, production here looking to be brought back online, and there's a polymer injection pilot happening. Daniel uh, works in Alaska, so uh, I I uh, trust your source of information for sure there uh, more than uh, kind of what the internet can provide. So appreciate that. And uh, definitely wants to watch, especially for enhanced oil recovery. You just mentioned a polymer oil uh, pilot. Some of these fields have never had enhanced oil recovery, at least not the entire field. So one to watch uh, as time goes on. A, a quick snapshot in 1986, 39% uh, of the production was standard oil, 22% Arco, 16% Exxon, and 13% was the state of Alaska. And 10% was your tiny little other ones. So. A, just a one snapshot in time in 1986, of course, is a few years ago, but just to show you that for those who are looking to get more information, there is so many PDFs and files and books and SPE papers on the history, like year by year by year, that you can really go back and learn everything you want to. Uh, for the purpose of this presentation, it's more of a overview to get you into the main things to watch for. And if you're interested, there's hundreds of uh, other PDFs and whatnot uh, out there that you can watch and, or, or read or whatever with, with data and with graphs and with text. Uh, it really is amazing. If the, the oil industry is very opaque in that it's very hard to understand the basics of it, uh, especially on the engineering side. But if there's a certain topic you're very interested in, there's going to be tens of papers you can find uh, within the SPE. Uh, platform uh, and one petrol platform where you can get lots of information as to what's happening. And here is Alaskan development today. So you see um, large roads being built. You get a gravel pad that is built on top of the permafrost. And then you have a very clean pad that can drill horizontally up to 10 miles. So uh, ConocoPhillips just drilled the world's longest well before UAE's Upper Zakum, uh, about about 35,000 feet, I want to say, of um, horizontal length that was drilled uh, there. So what is that, 10 miles, about 10 miles, I want to say, roughly. Um, no, six miles, so, so 10 kilometers, six to seven miles, but we are getting longer as we go. Here is the overall Alaskan field production. So you can see 1977, big rise, 1988 peak, and then what we would call our Hubbard's curve of decline. So it's, it's, it's in its terminal decline phase, and only recently with the advent of more horizontal drilling and companies like Hillcorp and Conoco becoming more interested here, do we now see a potential resurgence? But until now, it's been in its um, terminal decline, uh, uh, a sort of phase here. And we've lost a lot of production on the conventional side. What, what we would say that easy oil is gone is the area under the curve. So the area under the curve, if you just take what the area is, will be your cumulative oil production. And you can see how the easy oil is right here has been produced. We're now fighting for the scraps, possibly an increase here as well. But this is upwards of 20 to 30 to 40 billion barrels um, that's already been produced out of this field. Um, well, out of the state so far. So in 2014, when oil prices were still good, we had our little decline curve. There was these new projects that were being mentioned. We have Liberty, we have Ugnu, uh, Smith Bay, Fjord West, which is a Conoco project, Pickup. Um, which is now owned by Repsol and Santos. And I'll discuss all of these as I go on. But some of these projects got canceled, never really got brought back. But look at, look at the scope of the projects. Compared to this, we now have 
this. Once again, when you look at any conventional oil field in the world, the easy oil is gone. There was a mass panic in 2012 to 2014 as to what the world, what's going to happen with the world. Before the advent of shale, there was a massive panic uh, in terms of the oil's peak demand and peak production and peak supply. And how, how soon we forget and how soon we enter a apathetic state towards oil production, we become completely numb to what happens in a undersupplied market, in a oil scarce market versus an oil abundance market. And it's going to be very interesting from my perspective to see that mindset change over the next few years uh, as we do enter this, this oil scarcity market that gets scarcer and scarcer um, as time goes on. Um, this is the same graph to 2015. So you can kind of see that despite oil prices being higher in 2010 to 14, nothing, nothing really happened in Alaska. There was some discoveries, there was some development, but nothing, nothing all that crazy happened. Um, unlike some of the other parts of the world, like the Canadian oil sands or Iraq, which just tells you Alaskan oil was not as economic compared to bringing on a Canadian oil sands project or bringing on a Iraqi project or a Kazakhstan project, which of course had higher volumes to them. So a new project here would have added 20, 30, 40,000 barrels, Kashagan or Iraq, um, West Kurna, or some of the Canadian projects added multi hundreds of thousands of barrels, uh, each project uh, going on. Um, there's another comment here by, by Daniel, um, the AOGCC, so the Alaska Oil and Gas Commission, uh, provides free information on each well in Alaska, including completions information. For those that are following the activities of some of the juniors in Alaska, you know what he's talking about. Uh, and then the production rates are provided monthly um, as well. So here is a forecast that Alaska did in 2018 now. So I, so I started in 2013, I went to 2015, and now we're in 2018, nothing, nothing really changed. We are still in this, in this decline phase, not even able to maintain production. Um, this is, uh, sorry, this is 2016 that this came out. This is 2020. You can see BP, see Conoco, and then you see others. The others don't really have the money to do anything up here. It's BP and Conoco, and BP was bought out by Hillcorp which is now the producer that operates Prudhoe Bay, uh, along with owns a lot of the other fields um, in the area. And then Conoco being the owner of the Kuparuk River, along with some of the more Western Alpine fields. And then of course, the owner of the Willow Project, which sounds like it's a go ahead at this point, uh, since it got Biden administration approval um, about a month or so ago uh, at this point. Um, quick reminder, anybody that is on the Twitter space and you would like to join for the Zoom visuals, whitetundra.ca. If you scroll to the bottom under events, the Zoom link is in there and you can join in for the visuals. If not, the Twitter space will uh, continue running for the uh, audio only as well. So we have our daily oil and NGL production rate. Condensate is reported as oil as well uh, up in Alaska. You got Prudhoe Bay, you got Cooperook and Milne Point. Uh, Milne Point, uh, other fields in the Arctic Slope, which is basically nothing, you got Colville River, and then you got some, some other uh, fields as well. You can see that Prudhoe Bay and Cooperook are, are, are your main fields. Up to 2020, they were producing whatever we want to say, 80 plus percent, uh, maybe even higher of Alaskan productions. So these are the two fields, which I will discuss in the production part of, of the presentation here. Uh, as we go on, and then we've got Cook Inlet, which which was your the inlet near Valdez. Uh, obviously, a lot easier there because you're much further south. You're near infrastructure. You're near population. But the Cook Inlet basically died off uh, as soon as Prudhoe Bay came online, and it produces maybe ten thousand barrels a day today. Uh, I will have more information on that as well. The crude production today, you can see there were some new projects that came online in 2022. So Conoco brought on some new projects. Hillcorp has been working on some optimization projects and some new drillings, uh, uh, new drills, I should say, some new reactivations. 
And what happened? Well, we saw the usual seasonal drawdown that happens not happen. So production still didn't really increase, but this decline over the last four or five years was somewhat mitigated in a hundred plus dollar oil environment. Um, however, as we go forward, now the question becomes the same question I asked earlier to begin the presentation. What happens to supply at $80 a barrel versus 120? Would Conoco have spent another couple of billion dollars in FIDs in um, Alaska if oil was today still at 110? Does that change at 85? Does that change at 95? So there has been a permanent damage to oil supply because of the actions of the US government over the last 12 months, including the SPR release and the aggressiveness of the Fed. Um, it doesn't all operate in a vacuum. I keep repeating this statement. There has been a change to oil supply in 2024, let's say, if oil stayed at $100 versus what's happened now, both in terms of financial money being spent and in terms of the mindset of the people spending the money, um, especially now that interest rates are a lot higher. Now there's three factors playing into it. North slope production, as I mentioned earlier, Prudhoe Bay, we have Cooper Rook, smaller, and then Alpine that came online. Uh, this is more, mostly Conoco owned, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And then you have your, your pipeline minimum on the North Slope, which is your TAPS pipeline. If you have a 2 million barrel per day pipeline, you need to keep it flowing, especially in the winter. You cannot have oil go super slowly in it. It needs to stay warm and keep being pumped. So the pipeline does have an actual minimum. I don't think it's 200,000 barrels per day. I'd say maybe 300,000 barrels per day or even higher. But about five or seven years ago, there, there was this warning signs and, and alarm bells like, what is going to happen if we don't increase production here? Are we going to see a problem with the TAPS pipeline becoming inoperable or having a lot of problems in terms of oil freezing up in there? Need more heating stations, need more blending skids. Uh, to push this oil through. And so far now, this, this problem is looking relatively fixed, uh, but it is still something that Alaska will have to think about uh, as time goes on here. Here's your Cook Inlet, as I discussed, daily production. Um, this should have been in the production part of the presentation, but here it is. You can see why uh, uh, nobody's really doing much activity in the Cook Inlet now that the North Slope is seeing a resurgence and there's just not enough barrels here to be worth it. These tiny little projects are not worth doing for a Conoco or a BP or a Hillcorp. A little bit more about the history. You can see Prudhoe Bay is your main reserve uh, resource that was that was discovered. Cooper Rook, then we got Endicott, Point McIntyre, Alpine in the late 1990s. And then we got uh, some other ones here as well, including Pickup Project. Uh, that was discovered in the early 2010s. So uh, the pickup project was discovered by a completely um, exploratory firm, which is kind of interesting that they were spending the money in, in, in 2010 or, or 2012 to do that, uh, given you could make money elsewhere at that time. Um, here is your other discovery fields. So what we would call our smaller discovery fields. So we have uh, Tarn, we got Alpine, of course, the biggest one, that's the, that's a Conoco uh, mainly owned. And then we have smaller and smaller fields. You can see how the field size just gets smaller as time goes on. Prudhoe Bay was a million and a half. Cooper Rook was 500,000. Alpine was 200,000 at max. And now we got Willow is going to be 100,000. Pika is going to be roughly 100,000-ish. And then you have these smaller fields that are 20, 30,000 barrels per day. So once again, the easy oil is gone, but Alaska is a bit different. And I will discuss more as we go on why, because of the relatively low exploration that's happened um, in Alaska um, thus far. And here is a map. So for those who wanna visualize this a bit more, this is the North end of Alaska. You have your National Petroleum Reserve. You have your North Slope where a lot of the production was. You have your uh, Beaufort Sea. You have a little bit of a foothills. We have the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge. And then you have a coastal plains on the, on the wildlife refuge as well. So here is your overall map, the different areas. If this north slope right here 
so far since the 70s has produced 40 billion or so barrels. Look at the size of this NPR with very little exploration being done here. Pretty much no development in this area. And the US government specifically picked this area many decades ago as a national petroleum, petroleum reserve. You wouldn't just pick it because when you need it, you need the oil to be there. So you would pick a national petroleum reserve based on estimations of what that area actually contains. If this area contained 40 billion barrels and still produces at 300,000 barrels, and there's still enhanced oil recovery uh, projects being done. This is why I think it's important to know this information about Alaska in a structural bull cycle. All you got to do is just visualize what's happening here and the scope of things. And there's only a few areas in the world that can add multi-millions of barrels in a short period of time. Possible. I'm not saying it's going to happen. Possible as an oil bull, you believe in the structural bull cycle, focus on these areas. It's a better use of your time um, than to look at the small, tiny little projects that are happening uh, all over the place. A little bit more on the map. So we got Prudhoe Bay right up there on top. We got Cooperook River. We got Alpine. We're now moving further west. We have Willow Field. We're now moving further and further and further west. Um, the green is your oil discoveries. The red is some of your gas slash condensate discoveries. Some over here as well offshore. And we're now moving further west into the National Petroleum Reserve. Um, in terms of what the actual reserves are in the National Petroleum Reserve, very low. If you just looked at the reserve and say, oh, there's this much oil that's, that's in the 1P or 2P reserves, it's not going to tell you what's in this National Petroleum Reserve. I'm, I'm more asking you to do a visualization exercise um, of where we are. Um, and the, the kind of interesting thing is we, we don't know what kind of oil is going to be in there. So is it going to be a source rock oil? Is it going to be a semi-conventional deposit? Is it going to be an oil sands-like deposit? We, we still have that yet to figure out, uh, but, but will be uh, found as time goes on. You can see the growth that happened even in the Canadian oil sands. It grew from zero uh, SAG D-wise. It grew from zero to million and a half barrels in five, six, 10 years. So now that the technology exists, uh, we got to watch for the um, sources where that supply can come online. Um, any Yukon oil production in the Northwest part uh, bu, 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 uh, up here, you're saying? Um, not, not that I know of, but uh, for those that follow Canadian investors, Rafi Tamazian's Canoe Oil Fund um, I don't know if it's the oil fund or whether it's the energy fund or him personally has an investment in a company called Chance Oil and Gas that has a few wells in Yukon um, that are currently under restriction or some sort of problem. Um, but he did invest in that company. What does he know about the future of oil production in the Yukon? I don't care enough to read up on it enough that, that I can give you a clear answer. Uh, but I did find that pretty fascinating when I first found that out uh, through the internets. A um, little bit more that shows you the actual infrastructure. So we have our National Petroleum Reserve again. We have the Wildlife Refuge. This is the 1002 area. Why this is important is because these leases were given out about a few years ago and uh, were, were given out to companies on a bidding process. Here is your TAPS pipeline. Here is your Prudhoe Bay, Cooperook River, Alpine, and then the Willow project is now in here. And then the pickup project, I want to say, is, is somewhere up here. Uh, no, the pickup project is actually over here. And the Willow is next to it, to the left, to the west. And then there is a couple of projects that have been discovered up here as well, um, but a little bit further down the road now. So... Um, I'm just going to keep showing a bit more maps so you can understand where we are here and the size of things. The North Slope produced 
40 billion barrels, still produces at 300,000 barrels per day, the size of the NPR. Here is your uh, TAPS pipeline in black. Here is some other facilities that people want to propose going into the Cook Inlet uh, for LNG and other um, proposals. None of this really went through so far, but we'll see as time goes on what sort of developments actually occur here. Um, and I'll also discuss why the, why the gas line project is super interesting, uh, even though it may seem like, hey, there's there's no gas production here. So why why are you talking about this? We'll we'll talk about this a little bit more uh, as we go on. One more on the actual leases. So we have the new Conoco leases. We have some new other tracks that were given out on a bid process in 2018. The blue tells you the size of the oil production that was produced. So Prudhoe Bay, Cooperook, Alpine. Willow pick uh, on this side. So that's that's sort of the overall scope of things. It's a very concentrated area just because that's where the infrastructure is. That's where at one point there was a small refinery. It may still be operating. Um, and then for those who follow some of the more junior names in the area, you will recognize the name Al-Qaeda, um, which I will also discuss here as, as time goes on. Uh, Horseshoe as well is another uh, conical project, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that is maybe a bit further down the road here uh, as time goes on. The GMT2 Greater Moose Tooth well just came online in 2022. Not many people again know this. This well came online more than 10,000 barrels per day and looking really good so far for the other developments in this area. And all of this is pretty much unexplored. Nobody has really gotten here yet. You can see how it's almost like a um, water and icebergs sort of thing, like you really need that permafrost to do anything. Um, and it's going to be very expensive either way, no matter what you do. So it doesn't quite make sense in a 2015 to 2019 $50 oil environment. But in a $100 oil environment, things can change. Another map, just to get you more visualized as to where we are here, the, the individual wells, the pipeline network that was, uh, that was put up here, some of the pipelines in other areas that are not yet fully uh, developed and uh, sort of where we are, we have each of the units separately. So Milne Point, Baruch, and then we have what we would call offsets. So these fields like Tarn and Palm and some of the greater Moose Tooth fields, the reason they couldn't be produced is because they were too far. So you needed to drill 20, 30,000 feet horizontally in order to get to them. And that's where we are now. The drilling technology is good enough that we can drill 30 to 40,000 feet, which is why some of these other fields now are being drilled from existing facilities in one part of the field. Uh, we also have a Prudo a Bay tar mat. So this is something that uh, was pretty fascinating to me about when I first looked at this three or four months ago, I want to say, there's an actual tar mat here uh, where oil flows up and down through it um, underground, um, just, just based on the viscosity of the oil down there. Uh, pretty fascinating stuff for anybody that's, that's, that's into some of the underground geologic things that happen. Uh, look up this Prudo tar mat. Um, very, very, very cool. I won't go into it here because it's not really relevant. Um, here we have the geology, a bit more about the geology. So the mill point fields are very, very relatively shallow. We have the age of what are we drilling into? MA, million years ago. So some of the new fields like Pika and Willow are in the Nanushuk formation, relatively immature in terms of the uh, history of the deposition. So only about 100 million years ago, 80 to 100 million years ago that this was deposited. Uh, in the Cretaceous age. And then we have some of the older ones, like we have our Prudhoe Bay oil field uh, in the Ivishik sandstone. And this is now in the Triassic to Permian age, 250 million years ago. So very, very different depositional environments. Uh, we have what we call a stacked pay here, similar to the Montney formation in Alberta and BC. We have multiple uh, pays that can occur in the same drill in the same area. 
uh, Alpine and Kuparuk River are up here in the Kuparuk, uh, and then the Alpine sandstones, which are in the Jurassic age, 150 million years ago. Why do I keep mentioning these ages? Because this is where the names come from. When you have something like a Jurassic or a Triassic oil fields, you're talking about your Middle Eastern conventional oil fields. When you have the Permian, you're talking about a little bit lower, some of the shales, some of the source rocks from where the oil comes up into your conventional oil, uh, oil pools. The other thing to note, any oil formation must be capped by a shale because shale is impermeable. So we, you see the Nanushuk formation, there's a marine shale next to it. It, it completely locks the oil in place. We have all of these alpine shale uh, sandstones that are blocked by the Kingok shale uh, or any sort of unconformities. Uh, same with down here. You need a cap or a bottom that's going to be something that traps your oil in a higher permeability zone. And it may not be interesting to people, but if you're looking at companies in the future that are giving you this, this type of information, that are giving you the well logs, that are giving you other proxies, it's very easy to go and, and do a very simple check on some of these companies. I've looked at some companies that are supposedly exploring somewhere. They got a supposed working petroleum unit and they don't have any binding um, rock on, on, on any side of, of their supposed reservoir. That means your reservoir is gonna be very low quality because the oil has migrated up or down uh, within this reservoir freely. Uh, so if you want a very prolific formation, try to look for the shales or the unconformities that bound them, look at the ages, look at what sort of they can produce. Again, this is very detailed stuff that may not matter, um, but it's stuff that I like to share anyway, because uh, I never really got to learn geology uh, in my petroleum engineering degree. It was more production-based, drilling-based, completions-based. And now that I'm getting to go into some of the geologic stuff, I just find it fascinating. Um, Schrader Bluff, another name that may sound familiar to those who are looking at some of the junior names uh, in the area. This is the same map, but more on a, on a longer uh, structural fashion. So to the west, you have the Kuparuk River field. To the east, you have the Prudhoe Bay field. And these red lines are your faults. So any sort of movement that's occurred underground, it creates a fault. And the faults are what create these, these uh, uh, walls on the, on the sides of your formation where they get trapped. So, so look at this, this green is oil. And because that fault moved up, you now have a trap here that gets created. And on top you have your, whatever it is, your shale or your sandstone or a, a blockage there that puts oil in these little pools. And don't be confused by how small these pools look. Some of these are hundreds of millions of barrels of oil in place. Uh, uh, these pools that you can see, this is a Prudhoe Bay field right here. That's it. That's all it is holding 25 to 40 billion barrels um, of, whoops, of uh, oil in place. You have a Kuparuk field. You have all your other sort of tiny little fields all over the place. And source rock, is a rock that the oil, oil, oil forms in, goes up, it gets trapped in a sandstone or a carbonate underneath a shale. So that, that's entirely how these systems work. And if you're looking at any exploration plays, if you're curious anyway, check it out. This is the, the green arrows are oil spillage. So if you have a source rock and then you have a relatively permeable zone, it will go up into here. And then you have another relatively permeable, permeable zone. It will go further up. And then at some point it gets trapped. Whenever you hit a shale on top or an impermeable zone on top, that oil gets trapped. It just accumulates over millions and millions of years. And then 200 million years later, XYZ uh, drill rig comes on site, drills it and bang, you got a discovery. So a lot of history here, a lot of interesting stuff uh, happening. Uh, but the visualization on it, how oil fields form is almost identical, whether it's Middle East, whether it's onshore, uh, lower 48, whether it's Alaska, whether it's Canada, whatever, it's all pretty much the same. 
Now let's talk about the Alaska uh, National Wildlife Refuge. So there was some oil that got produced from uh, Point Thompson gas condensate. There are some oil fields discovered offshore. There are some onshore oil fields. And this is your, what they call a deformed area and an undeformed area. So there's some sort of uh, anticline. Uh, anticline just meaning that there's water, oil, and then gas on top, um, if I understand that correctly. And then you have a undeformed area, and then you got this area that got a lot of seismic activity uh, there. And then you have some native lands on top here as well. And look into it a little bit more when the discoveries happened. You see a lot of them, there's nothing here in the 2000s. A lot of this stuff happened early on. And now you have this, this entire area that is technically a wildlife refuge, but has now been given up for leasing in the 1002 area to oil and gas companies, part of which is our native lands. A little bit more about the tracks that were offered. So each tract is offered separately. If you have looked at any Gulf of Mexico sale or Guyana sale, it will look very, very similar. Uh, obviously, the native lands cannot be sold, so they are excluded from the sale. And then you have areas that are unavailable for leasing um, yet, or they may never be available for leasing. So this is 2021. A shifting mindset seems to be occurring. Not only are companies producing from the National Petroleum Reserve doing projects there, exploration stuff, not only is the North Slope getting more activity, but there's lease tracks being offered in the Alaskan National Wildlife Refuge. So here's the ones that got sold and who bought them. So we have Alaska Industrial Development and Export Authority that bought them. One tract, Regenerate Alaska, and one tract, another LLC. Not entirely sure what the, what the plan is here, uh, but definitely want to keep an eye out for when you see an area with so much increased activity, it definitely, for me, is something, okay, I have to watch this area, especially because it used to produce 2 million barrels per day, and it grew a million and a half barrels per day in two years at, at, uh, at a certain point in time. And they still have that pipeline capacity. So if Alaska did want to grow another million and a half barrels per day, they could do it no problem in terms of the pipeline capacity for export. Um, the same map, just showing you also the mountains and some of the river ranges and everything that comes here. And, and here is a zoomed out map of where we are. So we're right up here, northeastern tip of Alaska. And a little bit more about the ge uh, geology of things. We have, we, we have the Prudhoe Bay field. We have the Cooper Rook field. Now, the Willow and the Pika projects are both in the Nanushuk formation. It is a relatively uh, shallower formation, uh, more open to some horizontal wells and drilling. It is a what what some could call a bypassed pay. Um, we we see some of the pools on the eastern side of Alaska that that just missed the the uh, Nanushuk formation, and then as as the exploration moved west, they definitely hit this the entire way through. Um, obviously, Pika would be here. And then you have Willow and then and then some more as, as we go westward. And then there's this tectonic wedge. And again, I'm not going to pretend here to make any sort of conclusion as to what this means for further exploration west, but the Alaskan uh, National Petroleum Reserve is massive. So even after the wedge, there could be more and more and more things further west. And what they've shown here is vitronite reflectance. And Vitronite reflectance is a, like the, the definition of it is, it tells you whether the oil that you're seeing, was it created right where you're seeing it? As in, is it source rock? Or are you seeing it where it has migrated up somewhere? And the, and the vitronite reflectance just tells you the, the measure of that. Most oil will be found within 0.5 to 1% vitronite reflectance. And look where the Nanushuk group is. It's right between 0.5 and 1 in this nice little belt. And same with these other pools that were discovered uh, more to the eastern side. They are 
in this area. So when we look at exploration plays, it's not just well results that matter. It's not just seismic, 3D seismic. It's not just drilling a hole in the ground. There is hundreds of things that companies do. And please, if you're going to go and look at exploration plays in various parts of the world, ask, ask them these, the, uh, these types of questions. And if you get a hesitation from the geologist, uh, well, we don't know what's happening. We, we don't have these data points. We don't have the core samples. We don't have the, the drill cuttings. We don't have the ref, uh, reflectivity. Maybe, maybe just look at your risk reward again um, as to why you're investing in these plays. The reason I mentioned this is because as the oil cycle gets hotter, people are going to naturally gravitate to exploration plays. There's going to be a lot of good stuff out there. And there's going to be a lot of junk out there that is just putting a, a, a dart on the board and seeing what they hit. If you want success in the oil exploration game, get these information, ask this to the companies, see what they give you. If they don't have the information and they're still going out and doing a 15, 20, $40 million drill, be careful. Along with onshore Alaska, we have offshore Alaska. So we have the Chukchi Sea, the Beaufort Sea, which was earlier shown, the Cook Inlet, and then you have the outer continental shelf, uh, which is supposedly has a lot of oil, very expensive, very, very expensive drilling, exploration, and development. So I don't think a, uh, any of this is going to be active anytime soon, at least in a bigger way, but still stuff to watch out for. There is oil here. We know there's oil here just based on geologic mapping, seismology, trend mapping from, from Russia. I mean, Russia is just over here to the West from other uh, information, singular exploratory drills that were done back in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. We know there's oil here. We just don't know exactly where and how much, how economic it is. Can we develop it? But it's there. So we need to watch for what happens in these areas in a higher oil price environment, especially any major uh, development plans that start occurring. And this is a very interesting uh, way that the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management put this. They tried to estimate the economic oil and gas that could be produced from the Beaufort and Chukchi Seas. And they figured out combined, it's about seven and seven and a half billion barrels and about 30 trillion cubic feet. However, Look at the price they're using. They can produce that oil at $160 per barrel of oil and $12 per MCF of gas. Prices we have never seen, um, at least in the recent uh, uh, past, let's say, even if you inflation adjust. Uh, we, we have seen higher gas prices, but not, not sustained after the advent of shale. Uh, same with oil. So there is oil in the world. Anybody that tells you that we're going to run out of oil in the world not entirely correct. We're going to run out of oil that can be produced at $80 a barrel. We're going to run out of oil that can be produced at $100 a barrel. And then it just keeps going higher and higher from there. And the order of magnitude difference is a lot. There was a lot of oil that could be produced in the $40 to $60 to $80 range. There's not that much oil that can be produced in the $100 range. But in the $120 to $150 range, there is billions and billions of barrels uh, that's out there that can be produced. It just needs to be explored, developed, brought online, which is again, why I come back to my original point, this bull cycle, no matter what happens, there is a lag time between when you start to develop these projects and explore for these projects to when they finally come online. And that gap is almost a given that companies are gonna absolutely print money um, in that time period. Uh, but we still need to watch for any new supply coming online. Uh, we have some wells that were drilled in the uh, Chukchi Sea here. Shell has some. Chevron has some. Doesn't look like any new, uh, new activity happening, uh, at least in the near future. Alaskan electricity generation by source. I just threw this in there to give you an idea. Uh, mostly hydroelectric and natural gas. We do have some coal and and petroleum as well, which will likely be phased out here as uh, as a as time goes on, as more developments occur, they will likely have more hydroelectric um, and natural gas capabilities 
to, to transport that power to other parts. So where are we today? Fall 2022, the forecast for just the North Slope. Remember, this has already produced tens of billions of barrels. And yet some of the forecasts are still saying that we can go a lot higher. In opposition to the shale forecast I see, this is something that could actually come to reality because of the oil that exists on the North Slope that still hasn't been discovered or has uh, earlier, um, earlier not been uh, produced because it was not economic um, at the time. So here's your official forecast. Here is your what the operators are producing. Here is your low forecast and then your high forecast. Um, just give me one second here. We have a uh, hijacker trying to come in, so we will uh, move them. And okay, so um, that's that's that on the forecast here. So so definitely one to watch. I that's the point. I'm if there's one point I'm trying to get across in this presentation is there's certain parts of the world you have to be careful with them bringing on massive amounts of supply um, in a very short period of time, assuming they can get the investment dollars to do so. Alaska employs about 25 to 50% of people in or the oil and gas industry employs about 25 to 50% of people uh, in the state, whether it's directly or indirectly. Uh, directly is about 10%, 10 to 12%. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, Alaska is the only state that does not have a sales tax or personal income tax. Revenues have largely funded the government for decades, even at a lower oil price. Uh, we have private company employment in Alaska, wages and uh, the spending that the individuals do while they're in the state, property taxes, state taxes, uh, total jobs related to the oil and gas industry, about that, that about 10% uh, of the population, but it's 24% of the total jobs uh, and 27% of the total wages in Alaska are related to oil and gas. And I think those numbers are always underestimated because something like a mechanic shop or a barber or some sort of other industry that relies on oil may not be counted in here when it's only oil patch workers that are using those facilities um, as a business. So these numbers are always going to be underestimated uh, no matter what. Oil revenue compared to the dollar per barrel, you can see the fluctuations. And why in a true bull cycle, the torque on these companies is just insane. It's, it's just crazy. And for the people that keep, keep saying, oil is gonna be $80 forever, we're gonna be at three times cash flow forever, no other cycle has had that. So you're, you're literally betting against history and you're betting against the inherent cash flow torque that already is in these companies. And which is why, any acquisition made today, any buyback done today, in my opinion, is a much better use of cash than any sort of dividend or hoarding cash uh, metric or paying back debt at two and a half percent. Doesn't make zero sense to me, but it's just the way the industry has gone. And I've chosen to invest in, in, in companies that have deviated from that um, a little bit. Revenues, 80% of revenues, in the state of Alaska are from petroleum, 20% non-petroleum. They're able to keep their taxes very, very low. The cigarette tax, fisheries tax, alcohol tax, corporate income tax are very, very low in Alaska. And of course, no personal income tax, no state sales tax. Awesome. Um, whoops. So the contribution to oil production, I mentioned this earlier, 25% in 1988. Now it's down to 4%. Uh, what's happening here? So yeah. Uh, is down about 4%. That's where it is today. So that's that on some of the history, some of the geology, and some of the overview. Uh, we'll now get into the production overview and then talk a little bit, uh, talk a little bit about the future forecast and uh, then end it up with a little Q&A. A little reminder again, anybody on the Twitter space that would like to join for the Zoom visuals, whitetundra.ca. If you scroll to the bottom under events, the uh, Zoom link is in there. If not, the audio will continue running here. I'm assuming there's no problems with it, but I also never know because 
uh, I usually don't have anybody else on stage. So uh, if there's anything, please join the Zoom call and let me know if there's a problem. All right, so production overview. We have our producing assets. We have our GMT one and two, ConocoPhillips. We have PICA phase one, which is 51% uh, Santos. The rest is Repsol. We have a PICA phase two possible here. We have other discoveries, smaller ones, not entirely sure which ones there are referencing here, but smaller discoveries. And then you have the Willow discovery. The Willow ConocoPhillips project, if it goes through exactly as it is right now, will not produce first oil till 2027 or so. It will not be at peak production till 2028 or so. So when I mentioned earlier that you have really good line of sight as to, as to these projects and when they're coming online, there you go. Example number one, we know exactly the future uh, growth, supply growth uh, in certain parts of the world. What we have to watch for is excess supply growth that comes online uh, on top of that. A little bit more detailed here. So we have our Willow project. So 2027, 2028, we have PICA, we have the GMT, which is now online. Um, and these are really the main projects. I mean, if you want to follow Alaskan development, very simple. All you got to do is follow Willow, PICA, GMT, maybe Alpine, and then follow Prudhoe Bay and Cooper Rooks enhanced oil recovery methods. That's it. And you have the one area figured out. And this is why I spend a lot of my time these days getting a list, okay, in a structural bull supply cycle, where can the oil come from? Get a list and just track those. If there's any deviations there, now you got to watch them. If there aren't, the cycle continues as is, especially if shale cannot keep up and especially if shale continues declining or if shale starts to decline, now you need even more supply to impact the structural bull cycle. And let's be honest with ourselves. Shale may not decline today or tomorrow or maybe even this year, but when we're looking all the way into 2027 and 2028, I would, I would say my estimation and forecast for the Permian in 2027 is a lot different than what a lot of analysts and experts are saying. Shale can continue at this, even if it doesn't grow, can continue producing for the next five years at 6 million barrels per day in the Permian. A lot of question marks there yet, yet to be answered. Um, yeah. So who operates the fields? Uh, this is a bit of an older presentation, but we, we have uh, basically right now we got Hillcorp and Conoco as your main you got Repsol and Santos as the pickup project. And that's literally it. There's there's some other tiny companies out there, uh, but but nobody really of size making any any sort of big big things happen. Uh, Conoco and Hillcorp are very aggressive though. They they are companies that don't they don't just sit around producing things into blowdown. They they make things happen. Um, so definitely some to watch for. Uh, we have some fields that Hillcorp already had, which they bought, I believe, in 2014 from BP. So they've been slowly increasing their presence here. Now, of course, a major producer in the area, private company as well. Uh, Prudhoe Bay unit production, you can see they were saying it's going to decline in 2020 to 200,000 barrels per day. It hasn't. It's still at 300,000 barrels per day. So Hillcorp and their partners, um, I believe Exxon and Conoco are the other partners, uh, have done an exceptional job at keeping production online keeping their new wells drilled, keeping optimizations done, uh, uh, and keeping wells going. The field has over a thousand oil production wells at this point. So just keep that in mind, a thousand wells making 300,000 barrels per day. You, you do have a lot of maintenance and workovers and optimization, um, especially if you go into enhanced oil recovery, that needs to be done. Here is Prudhoe Bay. You have shallower fields, as I talked about the stack, you have shallower fields, then you have your middle fields, and then you have Prudhoe Bay. This is a uh, 
picture from Prudhoe Bay. The individual wells are in these shacks. The shacks are Arctic proof. So they protect you from uh, snow. They protect you from wind. They protect you from any animal attacks. Uh, this is your infrastructure, processing infrastructure. All the wells, collect the oil, put it in here. You separate oil. You might separate gas here as well if you're going to re-inject it. And then there's one main pipeline that goes. And then these are your other pads. They connect to the main pipeline. Poof, all they go into the main Prudhoe Bay uh, infrastructure. And then the oil is shipped down into taps. Very, very nice and simple process. And you can see a very interesting uh, environment to operate in. Um, muskeg in the winter becomes a white tundra. So um, amazing field, the biggest onshore conventional field in North America. Um, a little bit more on, on Prudhoe Bay, you have your non-producing oil zones, you have some producing oil zones with their porosities, permeabilities, a 300 milli Darcy field, just to compare, would be something like a Lloyd Minster heavy oil field would be in that, in that area, a really, really nice, uh, permeability on a conventional oil field is between one to five Darcy's. So we are a order of magnitude lower here, but still very, very nice. And you have your bulk of the field in this um, uh, one Darcy range, very nice porosity, 18 to 20%, um, and many, many different areas. And then you have your non-producing formations between them. So you can see how the geology has to happen for there to be a trap of oil that occurs, uh, which is your uh, Prudhoe Bay. Um, oil field. So, um, yeah, uh, just give me one sec. I got another hijacker here, so we will kick them out. Okay, right on. And here is our enhanced oil recovery. This may be an older picture. I don't exactly know, but it just looks older from an older SPE paper. Uh, you have a gravity drainage area in Prudhoe Bay. You have a bit of uh, enhanced oil recovery from miscible gas injection. And then you have a recovery from water flooding as well that is now uh, coming online. So uh, very interesting stuff. And you can still see there's some area yet to be produced with enhanced oil recovery. So we will watch this as time goes on uh, where they're able to keep Prudhoe Bay. I, I would not expect Prudhoe Bay to suddenly go to a million barrels because of enhanced oil recovery because the recovery factor is already very high in the field. That being said, the original oil in place number keeps getting put higher and higher and higher. So they produce more oil every year, but the recovery factor doesn't really change because they, they figure there's more oil here every single year um, than what was earlier predicted. Looks very similar to our uh, granddaddy Gawar in Saudi Arabia. Water injection on the side, producers in the center of your pool. Water injection, the blue wells on the side, producers in the center of the field. This type of structure, conic structure, where you have natural drive upwards. You drill your wells at the top of the structures and you push oil upwards. Seems very, very similar to that. These are our... Um, I'm losing the term now, but but these are our, our big prolific oil fields. And there's not too many of them. There's, there, there's only a few of them. Um, but every conventional oil field is relatively similar. I talked about Gawar being in the Jurassic Arab D zone. Exploration is done in the winter. These are our little trucks that go there. The, the, the well sites are built on gravel pads on top of permafrost, such that when the frost goes away, you still, well, the frost doesn't really go away, but it, 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 there's a winter and a summer and the gravel is what keeps it from moving too far uh, up and down. This is extreme winter territory. This, this is a fascinating place to be doing these kinds of projects. And it's not easy. No random company, as in, 
as what happened in the Permian, random private companies would come in, start drilling, go crazy, backed by private equity. It's not going to happen in Alaska. So it does prevent that one drill baby drill mentality from occurring. It's going to be Conoco, BP, Exxon, Shell, Chevron, if they care to come back here uh, to be. Otherwise, it's just going to be Hillcorp and BP. Well, BP's left now. Hillcorp and Exxon and Conoco that are left. Here is a winter photo versus a summer photo. You can see the pools of, of water in the summer photo that then become completely iced over. Uh, in the winter, you have little well pads, little roads, pipelines, infrastructure, uh, directional wells. They have producing units that then go and drill directionally all over and they cover the pool. And this is why I talked about the longer horizontals. If you have a pool right here, how are you going to access it? Well, you just drill longer because this might be a marshy area where you can't put a pad. This might be in the middle of the lake. This might be some place that is very sensitive to environmental um, regulations. So if now you can drill three times the length of the well, you can now act, uh, get access to some of these smaller fields that earlier um, were being ignored. So yes, very similar to Sakhalin in Russia. Yes, yeah. And, and Sakhalin is extreme environment, like absolutely crazy. Um, so yes, very similar. Uh, we have our little reservoir, as I talked about, as I showed earlier in the picture. That's it. This tiny little thing could contain upwards of 40 billion barrels. Where did it come from? From the kitchen. Here's a kitchen where the oil forms flows upwards into your trap. Um, sorry, I just got a call there. I hope the Twitter space didn't mess up, but uh, it flows upwards. And then these are what we call conventional oil pools. Very easy. You don't need to frack anything. You don't need to do any sort of major work here. There's a, a, a seal on top. There's unconformity on this side and the oil just keeps coming into the, the, the reservoir and pushes it upwards. You, you initially can drill in the bottom parts of the reservoir and produce oil, but then it will start to water out depending on the structure of the reservoir. And then you keep moving further and further up exactly what they do in Prudhoe Bay, exactly what they do in Gawar and Safania and Abkaik. It's all, it's all the same in conventional oil pools. The one caveat being we've produced a lot of it already uh, thus far. Yeah, and there's a comment here that says Gawar was used as an, uh, as an analogy for analyzing Prudhoe Bay. That's kind of funny because I didn't know that. I just saw the structure of Gawar from that one picture that I posted on my Twitter probably a year and a half ago. And I was like, wow, this is looking very similar. Uh, here's who owns Prudhoe Bay. Conoco and Exxon share 30, uh, 36% interest each. Hillcorp is 26%, but they're the operator because BP was the operator and Hillcorp got that through um, BP and then Chevron with a very tiny 1% stake. Um, will be interesting what happens here. Does Hill Corp, as they produce this more and more, want to buy uh, Exxon or Chevron out? Conoco, I don't think is going to want to sell. They, they are major producers in Alaska and they seem to want to expand here. So could go both ways in a sense. Maybe Conoco buys out the entirety of Prudhoe Bay uh, at some point in time. Uh, here's Cooper Rook. So we have Prudhoe Bay here. We got Cooper Rook in the center. A little bit of a smaller field. Its max production was only ever about 500,000 barrels per day. But you can see the central processing facilities, relatively same. And we have Pump Station 1. Pump Station 1 is where the TAPS pipeline starts. It ends in Valdez. So everything that's being produced here has to essentially now flow eastward into Pump Station 1. And you have, you see Pika here and Willow is somewhere over here further west. Mill Point as well, the Hillcorp owned Mill Point. And for those that are looking for kind of where the newer fields are, the shale oil fields somewhere down here, um, Al Qaeda and some of the other ones. A little bit more about uh, Cooper Rook. We have a few different fields. And then this is where the long reach ex uh, extended horizontal drilling really helps getting into these tiny little pools where 
tiny little pools that contain 200 plus million barrels of oil in place. So it doesn't make sense to build out a whole facility for it. But if you can extend a drill and get into it, it makes sense to go and access these reservoirs. Also 3D seismic. 2D seismic was able to delineate some of these pools, but 3D seismic has really helped um, get more understanding of Alaska. 3D seismic gives you 10, uh, 100 times the volume of data that a 2D seismic does. And you're able to drill with much more certainty uh, as to what's going to happen on your drills. So um, for those that are looking for why, why things changed, the 3D seismic does help us a lot um, in, in establishing these small pools that can then increase production or keep production flat uh, despite your legacy production declining as time goes on. Here is your Alaskan production. They don't even have a road. Some facilities do have a road, some don't. Some just have an airstrip. They have a private airstrip that they build, um, not very long. Get the people out, bring them to site. This is your overall camp and where everything gets produced. You have your little uh, processing facilities and then you have your other well pads that kind of feed into it through these connector pipelines. But I would love to go up here one of these days and you know really check check these things out. Uh, would be absolutely fascinating experience. Uh, honestly, winter or summer, even though I hate being in the winter now, now that I'm down here uh, in California, I think it'd just be cool to see the 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 places that man has gone to uh, provide energy for the world. Um, a very detailed current um, information on the fields. So you see Prudhoe Bay, Kuparuk, Mill Point, Al Qaeda, and Toledo uh, will be familiar uh, familiar to those that that know which name I'm talking about here. Point Thompson, Liberty. This is a new uh, field that that may be brought online. I will talk about this later on. We have Pika, which is Santos and Repsol. We have the actual PICA discovery here. I will also share why it's this shaped um, as this presentation goes on. And we have GMT, ConocoPhillips, and then we have Willow uh, in the Beartooth, as well as the uh, other discoveries up here that so far have not been produced. They're just too far west at this point. Uh, but again, something to watch for. The Willow Project peak production, 180,000 barrels per day. What if there was 10 of these? Now it starts to get a bit concerning for global oil supply and the US especially because the US is the place where capitalism will work its magic and people will start producing oil, especially when a pipeline already exists. So definitely one to watch. Um, here's Alpine. This is another ConocoPhillips owned uh, uh, area. Once again, absolutely gorgeous area, uh, probably a lot of uh, wildlife as well in the area, including birds. And you can see the airstrip right there. You can see the little road into your central processing facility and then the pipeline that comes in from various areas. Uh, but it's a, it's a very cool environmentally sensitive area. You can see why the Willow Project has so much opposition, okay? Without, without getting into a discussion on whether oil needs to be produced for the world or not, you can see why I, I do think it's important that the oil industry is really taking care of where they are here, um, as opposed to the middle of Texas or whatever. I mean, not to say one is more important, but one is more important uh, ecologically uh, than, than, than other places. Uh, the smaller footprints has allowed them to get some projects through because of the extended uh, long reach drilling as well. This is BP Alaska's portfolio as it used to be. They had more than 300,000 barrels here in 2000, some new projects as well. And then they just started selling stuff. They sold a few things to uh, Hillcorp and then they sold uh, this Cooper Rook. And now they're entirely out at this point in time with the sale of the Prudhoe Bay um, resource. And this is their overall reserves. Reserves I don't think mean, mean much in Alaska because the decline rates have been relatively subdued and some of the new production is completely unexplored and completely undeveloped. So how can you put reserves on something like that um, right off the bat, especially uh, 
uh, analogous to the entirety of Alaska. The five largest operators by production. So after BP sold their stake, we have BP plus Hillcorp being much bigger. Um, this was a $5.6 billion sale. So let's talk numbers for a second. The uh, sale was about 200,000 barrels ish, if I'm not mistaken, um, that was sold uh, 5.6 billion. Pretty good, pretty good price. And they got BP's exploration interests. They got the interest in the Trans-Alaskan pipeline system, and they got um, the other infrastructure that was already built. Seems very cheap uh, for this kind of purchase. Here's your TAPS, Trans-Alaskan Pipeline System. Uh, I just want to say, if you're going to be entering the Zoom, please use a real name because we did have two individuals here try to hijack the space. Um, and I just got to be careful who I'm letting in here uh, if you're going to be using a random random a, a name to get in uh, into this. Uh, but I do appreciate that. So here's your TAPS pipeline. Uh, you can see how it kind of goes up and down. It's it's accounting for the winter movements of the ground, uh, any changes in permafrost, any changes in seismic activity. There is uh, what we call expansion joints built into the pipeline, uh, such that the pipeline itself can sway uh, a certain extent without causing any problems. Uh, it is an above ground pipeline, which creates problems in terms of how cold the oil gets in the pipeline. Uh, however, you can't drill into permafrost to get a, a underground pipeline going. It would be impossible or too expensive. Uh, so it does have to stay above ground. And there's little blending skids and heating stations where the oil continues to get uh, lower viscosity as it goes through. A few stats on it. The air temperature along the range is negative 80 Fahrenheit to positive 95 Fahrenheit. It's a 48 inch pipe four feet diameter, very, very big. Uh, it goes all the way up to almost 5,000 feet uh, in its elevation and then comes all the way down. Uh, the maximum grade is 55 degrees. Think about that. The pipeline goes up 55 degrees, full of oil, very heavy oil that's now in minus whatever degrees and you have to keep it going. You can't have this oil freeze and block up and become a solid plug. So very cool engineering that happened here. About 800 miles I hear The line fill volume is about 10 million barrels, nine million barrels. The reason why line fill is important is, I've mentioned this before. When you look at US EIA inventory and you say, oh, we've got 460 million barrels here, no problem. That includes line fill, that includes oil you cannot get out of tanks at storage facilities. That includes oil at export facilities. You can't just pull that oil out and use it. So how much usable oil do we really have in commercial inventories? Something to keep in mind when people talk about, oh, we got 460 million of oil in storage. That's 23 days of uh, refining capacity. No, you, you can't just empty uh, pipelines and storage tanks down to zero and run your numbers that way. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Uh, right away, we got our stream crossings, 34 major stream crossings. And this I found interesting, 78,000 vertical support members. That's these ones right here. The support members, there's 78,000 of them um, that are um, over here. So a feat of engineering that was done in two and a half years or less, uh, very cool. A very quick note on BP. So they sold assets to Hillcorp in 2014. They sold assets to ConocoPhillips Alaska in 2014. Uh, not in 2014, sometime. They also sold the Alaska assets to Hillcorp in 2019. And look at what one shale acquisition did for them. The BHP shale assets they bought from BHP Billiton. It makes up for all those sales three times over five times over. And this is why shale became such a big frenzy because there was so much resource there. There's so much asset there. 
and this entire bubble is now the needle is getting closer and closer to that bubble, uh, the shale bubble, and companies are going to have to look back into conventional plays or deeper offshore conventional plays because this was very misleading. The, the shale boom, although it's been very successful in increasing production, the longevity of that has been very misleading. Um, even in even in 2019, people were telling me shale is forever. We got 40 years of resource. What are you worried about? Why why are you investing in oil? We got 40 years of shale resource break even. Twenty dollars a barrel. Twenty five dollars a barrel. I think uh, reality is going to come knocking on the door here. Like I said, that that, that needle is getting closer to that bubble um, as we speak. A um, little bit more on the oil. So the oil in Prudhoe Bay about 28 degrees API, 1% sulfur. Cooper Rook River is lighter oil, 23% or 23, uh, or sorry, heavier oil, 23 degrees API and 1.6% sulfur. Looking uh, very heavy, high sulfur oil here. And then you got Tarnfield and Alpine lighter grades, 37 to 38 API, very low sulfur content. It does impact the price you receive and how easy it is to transport the oil. If too much of this 23 grade oil started coming out uh, from the North Slope, it would be very tough to pump it all the way to Valdez. But because they're able to mix it with this lower uh, uh, API oil or higher API oil, it does help them keep the viscosity overall pretty good. Uh, we have this slope, the, the North Slope oil sales pipelines. So we got quite a few other pipelines that are relatively underused at this point the Alpine, the Milne Point, the fields are declining. They're not producing what they used to, but the capacity remains there. Uh, there's also all these unrestricted landing strips. So I talked about the uh, airstrips that uh, uh, are in this area. Some are unattended, some are village attended, and some are actually oil field uh, uh, monitored and controlled. We also have gravel islands that are being used for oil and gas development offshore. So you can see at what kind of water depth they're in, the size and how close they are to shore. We also have undeveloped resource that's still here. What is this undeveloped resource? It's either gas resource or oil that is too far away from the current areas and may be produced in the future with extended uh, horizontal reach drilling. Here are your undeveloped oil acreages. So when I say the National Petroleum Reserve has oil, we already know it has oil. The reserves don't really show what the true extent of this oil accumulation is. Here's why I'm able to say that with a lot of uh, confidence. Right here is where your Willow project is. Pika, Pika, Willow. You got these oil hits that have already occurred with very little exploration work across this trend. Down here is more gassy. Up here looks like it's all oily. If the US really wanted to increase production in national security effort and was willing to fund this, there is oil here in the billions and billions of barrels. Not, not even to mention what occurs offshore in the Beaufort Sea and the Chukchi Sea and the uh, uh, continental shelf here. Here are the tracks that were offered in 2019. So. Once again, the reason why Alaska is so fascinating is because they're actually doing things that show they want to increase production in the recent future. They offer tracks in the Petroleum Refuge. They are offered tracks in the NPR, National Petroleum Reserve, in 2019. And here are the tracks that were offered in blue. These are the, the purple ones are the ones already taken. And the um, gray ones are, or the yellowish ones are the uh, ones that are native lands. And these are unav uh, unavailable for re uh, leasing right now because of restrictions with the federal government. And who took these lands? Well, Conoco took what they wanted next to their existing assets. There is a North uh, Emerald Slope LLC that took some. And then there's this North Slope Exploration. They took this entire block right here, this entire block up here. That was 2019. What's going to happen uh, as time goes on here? 
There's also additional tracks that were taken here in the North Slope area. So the North Slope itself is not done. That also has upside uh, as to where it can go from here. And how much did they pay for it? Well, not, not too much, but not piddly amounts either. North Slope Exploration paid $11 million for this tract that they bought. And they got a lot of land for it, but I mean, 11 million is not just chump change that you just throw at random things if you're not gonna do something with it um, at some point. So, um, give me one second here. I got another. I don't understand like why why people take the time to do this because you you don't gain anything from it. I've got the security completely in the Zoom so good. All you can do is make comments in the chat. That's it. So um, keep on trying. Be better. Um, so these are the uh, leases that were taken, uh, the money that was spent on it, Oil Search being the company that discovered the pickup project. So they seem to be now back with doing some other stuff. Um, Great Bear Petroleum is what became Pantheon. So for those that are following that story, who spent the money exploring in, in Alaska? Not very much. From 2013 to 2019, almost nothing got spent. Um, Shell actually spent a lot of money in 2015, 500 plus million USD, didn't really get any meaningful success. And then oil prices weren't supportive anyway uh, for how things were going forward. Um, wells to be drilled in Alaska in 2020. As I said, we got really good line of sight into what is going to be produced in the future. What is going to be drilled? Rystad puts these out every single year. So all you got to do is follow them and say, okay, which are the wells I need to watch here and which ones can end up in major discoveries? Most inter uh, interestingly, look at this. Willow in a ConocoPhillips to be drilled in 2020 for appraisal wells. These appraisal wells were successful. Therefore, the Willow project went ahead. It's that simple. If you want to track oil supply in the future, it's that simple. Know your main wells that are being drilled. Know your main areas to focus on and follow them. That's it. We don't need to be tracking today's demand, tomorrow's supply. It needs to be more on a, on a cycle basis, especially if you're somebody that is now invested for a longer term in some of these names um, and, and you're investing more for the cycle um, going forward. Um, yeah, this was also interesting. Uh, Eni had a well in 2019 that they had spot in 2017 and continued drilling. So God knows how much money they spent on that and may or may not have hit, uh, have hit anything. Here's Charlie, one of 88 Energy, uh, which for those that, that know me, I now have in my personal portfolio. Um, and, and what got me to Alaska in the first place, looking at some of these things, we also have future value tiebacks into the PICA infrastructure um, as that gets built out. Top five discoveries by operator, Willow, PICA, not, not too much else here happening right now. So everything else is, is, is pretty low, uh, impact success rates, but the success rates are pretty good in Alaska, 70 to 80%, 90% uh, overall. And um, that's that goes to show how much oil there is still compared to offshore, which has a 15 to 20% success rate uh, in today's time. Uh, here's another picture from Alaska. So I just, I just threw a few pictures in here kind of throughout the presentation. Um, just to give you a scope of sort of where where we are operating the craziness of the places we're in here, um, wild, extreme climates. Yeah. So, so there's a comment here that the big problem in Alaska is the taxation is crazy. It's extremely expensive to operate and the environmental rules are expensive. What happens in a $120 oil environment for three years? We got to look for where the supply is going to come from. So, so although I, I agree with that sentiment, I, I hear that on a lot of different properties. It's true. 
but oil companies make a lot of money at $120 oil and they will bring supply online. So uh, they will crash your supply thesis, uh, your, your and mine supply thesis, uh, given enough reason to do so. Um, here is the major fiscal changes over the years. So we had a 12.5% royalty. We have an alternative minimum tax on top of that. And then a production tax. It's it, it's really interesting you, you made that comment right now because uh, we're just at, at this part of the uh, presentation. We have some uh, credits that they get. Uh, we had a fair share act that was suggested a few years ago that would have increased the taxes and 58% of the people voted against it. This motion was actually defeated. And one of the reasons why is because the people in Alaska realized taxation, more taxation results in a long-term supply issue on the very jobs that they do, the very production growth that they're looking for. Very interesting that a, that a uh, area actually recognized that uh, rather than keep hammering things with taxes, sounds like the EU, Colombia, all these places that just want to tax more, keep at it. You're going to restrict your own supply. And eventually your own revenue is going to start going down because a higher tax percentage on a lower uh, exploration and lower development, lower production, it doesn't work. That, that, that model has never worked in any place, um, it, especially when there's other competitive areas in the world uh, that companies can go to. Um, yeah. Uh, here's the cash flow sensitivity on the old scheme versus the new scheme. You can see the production credits. You can see the, the free cash flow, $32 a barrel at $100 oil price. Under the scheme that got defeated, it would have gone to 26 and the credits would have been gone. So definitely probably a, a good reason why companies still continue to go into Alaska is why this, this um, is because this new fair share suggested motion was defeated. If it does come back at, at a certain point in time, fantastic for me, love it. Because it's another place I don't have to watch anymore as closely. It's the same reason why I'm so bullish on Russia because Russia was a source of huge production increase throughout this decade. Now I don't have to watch it anymore. So I'm, I'm bullish on Russia as in, I think that the whole Russian uh, underinvestment now is a bullish case for oil price moving forward. It's another source of supply that got uh, pushed down the ladder uh, or, or pushed back uh, further years. The IRR sensitivity, so the internal rates of return actually went up with the changes that were made in 2014. So pretty good IRRs, depending on obviously a lot of factors. And this was using the, the Willow project as their case study. Crude oil production and rig count by year. Look what happened in 2014. As soon as the changes were made under the MAPA system, rig count skyrockets. It only fell because oil prices got smashed in 2014 and 2015. But there was a there was a real increase in exploration and development as soon as those changes were made. You got to respect uh, politicians and governments that understand that if you give the oil producers and explorers a break, they may increase production such that you benefit, not the other way around, where you do windfall taxes and then your production flatlines and falls off a cliff not only did you lose your royalty revenue, you lost employment revenue, state taxes, you lost the people that were working there, spending money, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the sheer stupidity of some of these governments is just, is just mind boggling to me. Uh, don't understand the basics of economics. Um, 101 economics. Uh, these are some of the refineries that are in uh, Alaska, may not be the newest picture here, but we did have a ConocoPhillips Prudhoe Bay up there, small little refinery. We had some uh, North Pole, they call it, and then the Valdez uh, refining infrastructure. And then and the Kenai is where the proposed LNG terminal is going to go. So they do have a refining plan or it's already, already working at this point uh, over there. So let's talk about natural gas for a second on production. Alaska produces nine BCF of gas natural gas per day, 9% of US production. 
However, 90% of that is re-injected. It's taken out, it's put back in the ground for pressure support in Prudhoe Bay, primarily Prudhoe Bay. That recycling, that gas injection is 82% of the total gas injection in the US. So the reason, there's a couple of reasons I mentioned this is oil, the gas oil ratio, when you're looking at conventional oil fields, in this case, it's hard to gauge where Prudhoe Bay is in its life cycle because we don't really know fully uh, what the gas oil ratios are going up to. The other thing is there's some new exploration that was done in Alaska where investors were using gas production as a negative. It is a negative because gas has nowhere to go in Alaska unless a, a, a gas pipeline is built all the way south. But all the, all the oil in Alaska has been high gas production. This is not something new that just occurred on one well or one area. It's always been producing a lot of gas. So just be careful. The reason I mentioned this specifically is the narratives that go on with exploration companies. Be, be very careful, look into them, look into the details of them, the depth of them, the history of them. You have to ask good questions if you want to be successful in oil and gas exploration plays. And this was one that got completely blown out of proportion the wrong way on one of the exploration wells that was drilled um, in another area. So um, yeah, for, for sure, keep that in mind. Uh, okay, so there's a comment here. Prudhoe Bay gas has 12% uh, CO2. Very nice, very nice. So it's like a natural CO2 flood in, uh, in a sense, um, especially if that gas... Uh, if the gas can come out of solution and then use it as a as a as a pressure mechanism, you are running almost a a, a CO two flood in a sense uh, on its own. So, um, a solvent flood. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll have to talk to you more about this, Daniel. I'm not entirely sure, but uh, um, that that is good uh, good information for sure. My my understanding from looking at some of the clear water wells and some of the multilateral wells in Canada is if your solution gas or your gas that comes out of solution has some sort of CO2 content, it naturally reduces the viscosity of the oil and makes it easier to flow. But the, the flood itself could be a solvent flood. Um, yes. Either way, it's good. Any, any solution gas that has some percentage CO2 is usually good for reducing oil viscosity and, and increases the productivity uh, of those reservoirs. So here's your gross withdrawals of gas. And then here is your repressurized gas. You can see relatively flat now. Uh, it just kind of staying there despite oil production dropping. So oil production has gone down more than 50% since 1995, yet the gas production is relatively the same uh, along with the repressurization. And the gas in Alaska that's actually used almost 80, 70 to 80% of that is used for lease and plant fuel. Very little is used in the power industry or for any other use within Alaska. There's just not a market for it. And there's only 750,000 people in Alaska. How are they going to use 9 BCF of gas? Uh, perhaps could be some interesting power gen projects or some sort of other projects that can come online in the future should the economics make sense. Okay, so... Um, yeah, for sure. Uh, for anybody that doesn't follow Daniel Michael on Twitter, he works in Alaska, uh, petroleum engineering background, I believe, and uh, part of the SPE as well up there. Uh, if you would like to follow up on this and you want to hammer him with specific questions, um, he will have the answers a lot more than me. Uh, so, uh, and, and do follow his feed because he does post a lot of stuff uh, on Alaska uh, as well, along with his participation in the Twitter spaces. So, uh, yeah, Daniel Michael 26 is the uh, handle. Okay, so we have our history. We have our production. So let's look at forecast. What else is coming online here that we need to pay attention to? Once again, a quick reminder of where we are. We have Prudhoe Bay, 33 billion barrels oil in place. We have Cooper Rook, 14 billion barrels oil in place. Number one and number two biggest onshore conventional oil fields in North America. 
right there. This is our shale slash semi-conventional fracking further opportunities that are coming up here. We have upside from obviously North Slope itself and optimization projects and recoveries and new uh, enhanced oil projects. We have the National Wildlife Refuge. We have offshore uh, Beaufort Sea. And then we have the NPRA, the National Petroleum Reserve. These are our forecast. There was a pool that was discovered up here as well in Smith Bay. Um, I forget the name of the company. I think it was Oil Search actually that, that also discovered this. And you can see the oil trend where it's going all the way here in the reserve. Down here is all gas. And here we go. So a little bit more information now. On top of that, we have the Greater al qaeda which is a semi-conventional fracking play. We have Talida, uh, both owned by Pantheon. We have 88 Energy with their Merlin, their Ice Vine, and, and also some acreage here. We have uh, this supposed billions of barrels in place. I will not use that as a true number. Let, let the play pan out and we can see what's here. We have ConocoPhillips Willow with almost 600 to 800 million barrels of oil recoverable. Um, the production number has come down a bit since when they initially proposed this project. We have the Pika Horseshoe project, which is this elongated fashion and also may go offshore. Not entirely sure yet. Uh, it is being worked on as we speak. And then we have this, uh, of course, uh, sorry, it was not oil surge, it was Kalos Energy that, that found the Smith Bay, 2.4 billion barrels recoverable. These are massive, massive oil fields. If somebody's willing to take the time to go out there, build infrastructure, build a pipeline all the way back into the taps, or have some sort of icebreaker vessels that they ship out of and um, produce these oil reserves. We also have next to the taps is the Dalton Highway. It's an actual roadway that goes all the way next to the TAPS pipeline and comes all the way up here uh, up to a certain point and then it just stops. So they do have a supply road as well. It's not that everything has to be helicoptered in. Uh, there is a roadway. Some of it is ice only, ice road only. And then some of it is um, also accessible, I'm assuming, in the, in the other months uh, as well. But just keep in mind, the drilling programs or any major exploration programs can only occur in the winter here. So from today onwards until September, October, November, you're not going to see much activity going on. It's only in the winter that these programs can really be accelerated on that layer of ice, especially to bring equipment in here. Drilling rigs are not light, very heavy uh, pieces of equipment that got to be brought in. So ConocoPhillips got the Willow Project. They have not just the Willow Project, they have other Alaskan assets that are adding about 50 to 100,000 barrels per day by 2027, 2028. So Willow is really adding, uh, or sorry, Conoco is really getting quite aggressive here uh, with their development plans in Alaska. We have the overall production producing. We have the other production. We have whatever is being appraised, new discoveries, and then undiscovered, awarded, and undiscovered open acreage. So look at this wedge, it's getting bigger and bigger because there's undiscovered open acreage that they just put in here till 2050. If that really starts getting explored, you will see a resurgence in Alaskan oil production, especially in a, a higher oil price environment. Okay, so the ice roads are being closed tomorrow on the slope. There you go. So that's, that's that for the season of any sort of very high impact activity uh, for this year. Remaining resource in Alaska by area. So we have the wildlife refuge actually has oil. Billion, 1.35 billion barrels of oil open. In the National Petroleum Reserve, just right now, we have, uh, look at the production, very low, under development, the discoveries, and then what's open still. And we don't know. The, the open acreage could be 10 times this um, in terms of actual uh, recoverable reserves that end up getting found. And once again, the reason I present Alaska today, because they are shifting. They are shifting from onshore, north slope production, 
right there and offshore production to the NPR. More and more activities going into the NPR and something to watch. It's the same reason I mentioned Brazil. Watch what happened because the reservoirs have gone from post-salt reservoirs to pre-salt reservoirs. There's a big difference in geology there and the mindset and the production. The same point I can make for Alaska. We have gone from this legacy conventional decline production to the National Petroleum Reserve, which is growing production and has a lot of barrels uh, are still to be produced. So, um, and then you have the rest of the offshore, which I'm not gonna talk about because it's way too expensive and it's too far out at this point. Nobody's doing any sort of real exploration development work offshore, but there is multi tens of billions of barrels offshore Alaska that has yet to be discovered uh, and, is, and is going to be discovered at, at a future point in time when the world needs that oil. Uh, yeah, there was a TV show called Ice Road Truckers. Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, that was, uh, I think it was a few episodes. They were delivering uh, groceries and other stuff up there north, but uh, I don't remember if, there, if there's any oil-focused ones, but, but that would be pretty cool uh, to see. So Alaskan oil production growth in the next decade. Now, keep in mind, this is not just growth. It has to make up for existing declines as well. So we have Liberty. GMT, Nuna, we have the two PICA phases, we have Willow, and we have Norwal, and the al Qaeda is your shale oil slash sandstone frac oil um, that still can come online as the years go on. We'll discuss all these projects here uh, in the next few slides. Before we do that, we have LNG routes. There is a proposed, um, un well, operational Kenai LNG up near the Cook Inlet, that is sending LNG up into Europe, into Asia, into the main uh, import terminals. They are competing with LNG Canada and Wood Fiber and the ones on the West Coast of the US, along with the Arctic LNG that Russia has um, that are now getting more and more postponed as far as their expansion as time goes on. So Alaska is actually in a pretty good spot. If they can build a gas pipeline down, and produce more of these gas assets up in the North Slope, they, they could become a major producer of LNG. Uh, it's just that gas and pipelines in minus 40, minus 50 Fahrenheit on surface, risky, risky business. Maybe somebody gets it done in the future, we'll see. And that's why Canada has such a competitive edge in, in where their BC and Alberta resource is uh, in the Monty. Here is what the LNG facilities looks uh, looks like for those who have never seen these before. There's a, different trains, you have your power gens, you have your storage, uh, all this other admin stuff, some tanks, and then you have a pipeline that goes out. And once it's liqui liquefied, it goes out and, and, and loads these um, LNG tankers. The tankers don't actually come right here. They go all the way out and they, and they get loaded and then they leave. Um, Keeney, okay. Kini LNG, yeah. Um, there's also a very interesting Alberta to Alaska rail link that was proposed at one point, that they'll bring the oil here, then they'll rail it down to Fort McMurray, and then use the pipelines from there to take it down into the uh, lower 48 of the US. This was a $17 billion project that so far, there's been nothing really happened on it. But if this area starts to produce a lot more oil and there's not enough tankage that can be taken out of Valdez, uh, Valdez, you would have to have something like this built. We'll see. It's way too early to be making these sorts of uh, conclusions, but definitely uh, stuff to watch for, yeah. Okay, let's talk about the projects. Willow Project started in September, 2018. The Bureau of Land Management completed their scoping studies uh, ConocoPhillips was in this doing a bunch of work, doing the appraisal wells. Uh, they had a court issue a decision for the cases that were challenging it. Then there was a second scoping study. And then finally, the Bureau of Land Management proposed a different structure. So Willow first was going to be, be developed with five pads, five individual pads with extended long reach drilling on them. 
what got approved from the Biden administration was three pads. The environmentalists wanted two pads. The reason you can't do two pads is there, there's a scale you need in order to uh, achieve project economics. And the three pads work as a, as a middle ground. So if any environmentalist tells you that the Biden administration just approved Willow, the BLM just approved Willow without looking into it, I can guarantee you I've looked into this very deeply. The five pads was way too much. I will agree with that because this area has some migratory nesting birds and it's a caribou uh, area where they have these uh, routes that they take. So the three pads was a very middle ground decision. The two pads, if you run the economics at it, it just was not working. They weren't able to produce the oil uh, that it made sense to do this project. So a lot of environmental work has gone into this. Do not listen to anybody that tells you that uh, oil companies are getting free rides here in terms of doing any production wherever they want and doing whatever they want. Completely false information. Um, the Willow Project economics. So obviously the first few years is capital, very capital intensive. You are spending a lot of money getting these pads built, getting the infrastructure built, the pipelines built. And then 2027 and 2028, things really go the other way. And you get this production profile with your free cash flow. You can see the government's take on it. And then you still have CapEx. As time goes on, you still have CapEx. And then once you've drilled all your wells in the field, now your CapEx gets substantially lower and you're just blowing down the field, getting your free cash flow. But the production also does decline. There's, it's not going to stay at peak, per, uh, peak production forever. The new conventional oil fields that we're discovering are staying at peak production a lot lower than the old, more prolific conventional oil fields used to. So just keep that in mind. When they say peak production, Gawar was at peak production for 30 to 40 years. Uh, Prudhoe Bay was at peak production for 10, 12, 15 years. It's not the same for these new projects. They get there, they stay there for a few years, and then they start declining. The NPV of the project at different rates. When I talk about torque, it's a real thing. Look at the torque on this project between $50 oil, $70 oil, run the same at $100 oil, and then at the different discount rates, which I don't know why you would ever run a project at a 20% discount rate, but we are in a new interest rate environment. Financial people act differently than how I think about discount rates. So it does change the economics a lot on these projects, uh, depending on, on where you see them. Um, here is the area where the Willow project is going to go. So you can see very environmentally sensitive. Uh, these meandering rivers are, are very good for the migratory birds. Uh, the caribou use these as their uh, grounds, as their roots. So definitely want to uh, really watch. And guess what? There is a 212 page PDF on the environmental impact statement that Conoco and the Bureau of Land Management, uh, along with the ocean something uh, committee worked on. In that they identify all the migratory birds, what they do, their abundance, references. There's a lot of work that goes into this. I once again repeat, anybody who is against oil development and thinks it's just a free ride to print money is severely mistaken. A lot of work is going into this. And I say that for two reasons. One is to show you the kind of work that's being done uh, in order to make sure the oil industry is not just throwing oil on the ground and, and spilling and all this. But also the second reason is supply will take a long time to come online. Even if more oil is found, even if you have the infrastructure, even if you have the prolific capacity, even if the economics justify it, this work, unfortunately, in today's world, unfortunately or fortunately, has to be done. So I once again come to my three to five year lag time between supply coming online. And that's where the bull thesis gets so strong for oil, where, okay, even if you discover the oil, you're going to be stuck in permitting for two years and environmental studies for another year after that, and then three years of construction, and then the oil comes online at the end of the decade. So 
the bull thesis in that sense, it's stronger due to ESG, not just because ESG has, has restricted investment, but because ESG requires all this stuff to be done. And there's a lag period there where the world thinks they're going to get off oil in the next three years. Reality may have something a bit different to say about that. Here is the reduced footprint. So the extended reach drilling that I keep mentioning, a 12 acre pad can hit 154 square miles. In the 1970s, a 65 acre pad, five and a half times the pad size was getting 150th, 150th the area accessed underground. So effectively, what do we have? We have a 250 to 300 X increase in the efficiency of drilling in Alaska in just 50 years. Amazing. The cost to develop Willow, $8 billion. So $8 billion to develop a field that has a 20 to 30 year life with a peak of 100,000 barrels per day. There's a public company in Canada, an oil sands public company making 100,000 barrels today with 40 to 60 years of reserves trading at less than $8 billion. Hence why anybody that tells you that this is the end all be all for cash flow multiples or production multiples doesn't understand where, where the oil cycle is and what new developments are costing um, in terms of where the oil in the future is gonna come from. So um, just, just think about these things a bit. What, what do companies currently trade at? What are companies or, already spending on new sources of supply? And what's, what's the actual fair value of something that's already producing with multi-billions of CapEx already spent and more reserves in the ground? And probably a lower operating cost than this area. On the spill side of things, 85% uh, of the spills are less than one barrel. 99% of the spills are less than 50 barrels. When you produce four, five, 600,000 barrels a day out of Alaska, and 99% of the spills are less than 50 barrels, this, this, is a, this is an industry that has done a lot of work in the last few years, in the last few decades, controlling the spillage, a lot of work. And it has shown in the quantity of oil spilled. Whenever you have an operating, operating physical system, there's always going to be risk that the mechanical system breaks. But when it does break, the industry has done a great job at controlling that and shutting in those systems before it becomes a big problem. So once again, I'm trying to go against a narrative of oil companies are polluters and they don't look after the environment. They do way more work than guys that go on highways and block them or throw oil on paintings. It's, it's not even worth discussing how much work, the, the difference in the amount of work and the, and the effort that gets put into these things from the oil company's perspective compared to uh, Joe Schmo on Instagram looking for 100 views. Uh, the other things I want to talk about is Nixon in 1973 unveiled a project called Project Independence. What did it do? It increased supply using the Trans-Alaskan Pipeline System being one of the main projects, but also they reduced energy consumption. So they reduced the maximum highway speeds, they converted oil-fired power plants to coal, reduced oil consumption, increased oil production. The U.S. has a history of doing these things. I'm not saying it can be done today in today's political environment and with the people who are running the show, but the U.S. has a history that when they get pushed against the corner on energy independence, they deliver, and they deliver very fast. This is one example. The Permian Shale is another example. Where else in the U.S. is there large quantities of oil that can be produced in a short period of time? Should every single people involved before it, only one place, Alaska, that's it. The Gulf of Mexico can't do it. They, they cannot increase a million barrels per day in two years. It's not happening. So focus on the areas that matter and, and focus on what the longevity of it is. Focus on when the mindset starts shifting towards energy independence and national security and whatnot. A lot of environmental 
uh, call it roadblocks, excess roadblocks can get taken out of the system when national security is at risk. So that's the Willow project. We have other Conoco projects. The uh, one that I talked about, the GMT2, we used the Doyon rig. The Doyon rig was able to drill uh, 6.7 miles laterally. And the well produced 10,000 barrels per day right off the bat. Um, it's in the, actually this one is in the Alpine development, uh, Fjord West. It was a small little um, inaccessible pool until these extended reach drilling uh, records start to happen, and the, the the rig is called the Beast. It can drink, uh, drill seven and a half miles long, so there is more now that can be accessed. And a little uh, feat, this was uh, fabricated in Alberta. So, you know, Alberta is really where the oil patch expertise um, exists, and, and fabrication and, man and manufacturing, and a lot of technology and innovation does come from Alberta. Um, 270 trailer loads to take it up to Alaska. You may remember looking at a news release about two years ago that one of the loads uh, went off the ice road and ended up getting stuck or something. Uh, that was a kind of a funny story at that point, uh, but they finally did get it up uh, to, to where it needed to go. And uh, yeah, 1.3 million pounds with the 3,000 horsepower engines. Uh, Doyon 26. Uh, absolutely insane. And here are some more about Conoco's areas. They, they obviously have Kuparuk and Prudhoe Bay, the, the share in there. They also have Alpine, uh, CD5, GMT, Greater Moose Tooth. And then they have the Bear Tooth unit, which is where the Willow project is. And they also have these other lands. Sounds like they're setting up for, for a pretty significant push here um, or for increasing production even further once things go well um, here, they also own 29% uh, of the uh, Trans-Alaskan Pipeline System. Uh, Harvest Alaska, which I believe is Hillcorp, uh, owns 49%, and then Exxon owns the other 21%. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is as more oil enters the TAP system, the operating cost of the TAP system goes lower. So what I've read is that just adding the Willow Project uh, is going to decrease the cost by $1 per barrel for every barrel that flows on the TAP system. So there is a operating cost synergy to what these companies are doing here. Conoco also owns polar tankers. They own five vessels, double hulled. Double hulled means if one of your hulls fails, you, you don't spill oil. It goes into the area between the two hulls and just stays there uh, rather than spilling into the water or wherever else. And these um, tankers, they take oil from Valdez into the West Coast refineries in the US or elsewhere uh, in the world. So this is why I mentioned that if Conoco and the other producers keep increasing production, it is possible the, there's only so much export capacity out of Valdez and may have to go somewhere else uh, at that point in time. Yes, correct. Yeah, yeah. So. Uh, Alaska is very transparent with their information, the production rates, everything else, and they have a daily production rate they post uh, at Alaska Pipeline on Twitter. And uh, Giovanni uh, Stranovo, for those who follow him, posts a weekly summary of that uh, every single week. I, I believe it's, it's his account, if I'm not mistaken. So you can track what the daily production rate was. Seems like it's very easy to track these these things. If you're a oil bull, structural oil bull, there is no excuse for getting caught this time on, on, on some sort of Permian issue where production comes out of nowhere and keeps growing. I think, I think we should be able to track these things, if not like myself personally or you personally as a group, uh, as a Twitter group, uh, without having to spend all day doing these things. So a couple other fields, Conoco has been working on the Narwhal field. Uh, they, they are going to drill it from the existing CD4 uh, Alpine drill site. And they also have a NUNA facility uh, a deposit that they're going to do very similarly. And what they're doing right now is just hitting these extended reach targets that were previously inaccessible. Meanwhile, working on the Willow project and other exploration as their growth projects. And 
these are not easy drills. There's collapse of the well bores, drilling equipment can get stuck. You can have re-drilling, site tracking, cost increases. It's not abnormal for this part of the world, whether it's development or exploration. We also have the uh, Nuna project that ConocoPhillips bought from Kalos Energy, Kalos Energy being the exploratory one in Alaska. They paid about uh, 400 million, I wanna say, for 200 million barrels of oil in the ground. So pretty good uh, deal for Kalos. They, they uh, figured this out and then they've resold this uh, into Conoco. Conoco also bought Anadarko's stuff in the um, Alaskan area. And they paid, keep this in mind, they paid $400 million for 200 million barrels of gross reserves and 900 million barrels of other risk reserves. When you look at exploration companies in Alaska, try and compare them to earlier transactions that have occurred rather than using whatever number the exploration company is giving you. They'll tell you oil in the ground is worth two bucks a barrel or five bucks a barrel. The transactions have not happened at those at those um, uh, metrics in the recent past. So always, I keep coming to exploration because there's a couple of exploration companies in Alaska that are very polarizing and exploration in general is going to be a bigger uh, part of the ENP schemes um, going forward in a bull cycle. So just keep these things in mind. What, what are things transacting at? There's a lot of other information out there. What information does the exploration company have? What are they willing to share and give you? What do they even have to begin with? Um, so Nuna is going to be 30 wells, 20 to 25,000 barrels uh, of oil per day. They, it was supposed to be online earlier. I'm not entirely sure. I don't, I don't think this is online quite yet, um, just because of delays with the oil prices in 2015 to 2019. And the straight just approved the expansion of the uh, Kuparuk River unit drill site. So they will extend the drill site, then go drill, extend it, reach horizontally to go and hit this Nuna field and 20 to 25,000 barrels per day. Hey, it mitigates your existing legacy declines. Uh, and maybe as time goes on, the other projects can actually add production to, um, to Alaska. GMT is the other conical project, Greater Moose Tooth 2. It has about 140 million barrels of oil in place, uh, or sorry, 140 million barrels recoverable oil, 30,000 barrels per day, um, 18 producers, 18 injectors, and it's relatively short, two to three mile laterals. And this one is actually already online. So that, that little increase you saw in Alaskan production mid last year, that was some of these projects coming online. And they will be using a water and what we call a, a WAG scheme, water alternating gas injection scheme to maintain the original pressure, uh, pressure and keep the recovery factor relatively higher. One small note, these things can only be done on conventional oil reservoirs. So when we, when we see these continual projects being done, they mostly 99.9% .9 only apply to conventional oil projects which is what makes Alaska even more interesting compared to like an Argentina where, okay, shale can increase production, but hey, it declines at 60, 70, 80% a year and you can't do any enhanced oil recovery versus these sorts of projects, uh, which are more uh, longer, longer, higher stability projects um, in the future. We also have the Liberty Project. This is a I believe it's a BP project and now um, Hillcorp owns it, obviously. It is offshore, as you see, about uh, 150 million barrels of oil in place, uh, recoverable oil in place, 40,000 barrels per day. And what's it gonna cost? Well, BP said 1.5 billion. And then they said, no, it's gonna cost us a lot more than 1.5 billion. There's companies trading today, 40,000 barrels per day, roughly for less than 1.5 billion US. And BP said it would cost a lot more than 1.5 billion. You can see why these projects are not going to go ahead until the companies re-rate. That is the end all be all. Until the companies themselves re-rate to a higher multiple, 
where it makes sense for them to go and do these projects, they would just buy on the open market. They'll buy other companies. They will keep buying back shares. They're in another bullish catalyst to the, to the both owning the equity and the supply side of things is money is not going to go into supply, even if the projects are worth it, until it's more expensive for the companies to buy back their own shares or buy back their peers, as opposed to do new uh, projects like this. And this project is uh, has some sort of history to it. BP Alaska Exploration at the time, President Doug Suttles said, this is about as sexy as it gets for exploration through technology. Doug Suttles obviously uh, was with BP when they had the uh, Macondo disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, uh, didn't, didn't really do well there. BP ended up not being able to do, do any of these projects and they ended up selling to Helicorp obviously in 2019. And Doug Suttles had another poor uh, performance at Incana after that. Um, so things, things went sideways pretty quick for him uh, there. Although now it looks like maybe there's a recovery uh, possibly somewhere else. I don't, I don't follow him anymore, but just something the Calgary uh, oil and gas folk would, would recognize the name. And as to who was the president of BP Alaska Exploration when the Liberty Project was looking like it would be a go-ahead. Pickup project. So this is the other big one here. Santos owns 51%, 49% is Repsol. It was discovered by Oil Search uh, and Armstrong Oil and Gas. They bought each other's stake and whatnot. And GMT was another name up there. GMT, of course, the one that now has stakes in some of the Montney producers. And an FID decision was made in August of 2022 for a $2.6 billion project. Phase one in 2026, 80,000 barrels per day. This is the exact project that today would not get approved. It was approved in mm -hmm. August of 2022. I'm sure all of you know the euphoria and the gains and the profits that were being made in August of 2022. This is what I mean. Supply does not operate in a vacuum. Because the price of oil has come down in the last few months, these types of projects that may have been FID'd in other parts of the world have gone pushed back. Therefore, the supply response keeps getting pushed back. Meanwhile, in a lower oil price environment, demand continues to rise. Demand rises anyway year over year, but in a lower oil price environment, it rises even more. And, and therefore, I'll just make an overall point here. When people say, why are you in oil? Aren't you worried about a recession? I say, bring it on. Bring on a recession. Well, let's, let's hamper this demand more or let's hamper the supply more and let's bring on more demand here because there's a limit here that OPEC will protect to this price, bring on the recession. You, you're going to just screw up the oil supply demand even more. That wedge is going to get, it's, it's already too big. To be honest with you, it doesn't even matter at this point. The wedge is too big, which is why I feel very comfortable uh, holding these names and investing in them as an actual investment, not just a trade trying to get out of it in a month or two or three. Here is the PICA unit. So the uh, orange is the actual PICA lands. And then the PICA oil unit is your, uh, in the purpley uh, outlines here. This is some of your uh, infrastructure in PICA. You have a boat launch, you have different uh, operating sites, you have a processing facility, and then all kinds of pipelines and production sites that, that bring oil back to the production facility, about 400 million barrels of 2P reserves gross. You have a $2.6 billion capex uh, on this. The annual operating cost is $150 million um, gross. And then the IRR is about 19% at $60 a barrel. Doesn't sound that great. This project would have never gone through at $60 a barrel, not a chance. Uh, life cycle break even oil price, $40 a barrel. You can say it's a break-even oil price, meaning, okay, that's the break-even at which the company would maybe go and do this project. Completely wrong. That's not the definition of break-even oil price. Which company in the right mind would spend all this time buying out these assets, doing the exploration, doing the appraisals, putting the work in, dealing with uh, the environmental part of things, putting their engineering team at work on this, 
and then go and produce it at $40 a barrel for a zero NPV. No, no company in the right mind is going to do that, especially at a time when oil is getting harder and harder and harder to find. So use the term break even oil price a little more carefully, understand what it really means, but also think about what is the actual break even of this? What, at what price does it justify the company going and doing these projects? I don't want any company doing any project that's a break even oil price. Uh, and the company makes zero NPV at that, at that price. There's no reason. I'm not even sure why this has become such a overused term, both in shale uh, and in conventional, because business-wise, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense uh, to really use it in the way that people use it as a, okay, at $40 a barrel, this project is economic. Therefore, Santos would go and do it. Any CEO that thinks that way is not going to make it. Um, PICA has big up, big implications. The first phase is 80,000 barrels per day. Lower the tariffs by another $1 per barrel uh, on, on the TAP system. So the more they produce out of the out of Alaska, the more synergies that some of these producers are getting. And it's very highly concentrated in terms of the production and who owns it at this point in time. Uh, PICA is going to produce 14 tons of greenhouse gas per thousand barrels, which is compared to 40 for new onshore projects. The way they do it, and again, they're putting in the work. This is not greenwashing. They're putting in the work. They're using gas turbine power distribution. They got waste heat recovery on all their gas-fired uh, turbines. They have drilling technologies that are longer drilling, less pads, uh, and then venting and flaring are not allowed, which is the greenwashing part of things because every company is not allowed to vent and flare except in non-routine situations. Um, and, then, and then this is really the, the, the very interesting part. They are paying the Alaskan native corporations who own trees some sort of money to buy the carbon credits from them for a forest management scheme. Effectively, what a forest management scheme means is you will not cut down these, for, uh, these trees on your land. That's it. You don't really have to do much more than that. And you generate carbon credits, you sell them to the oil and gas companies, and that's where the greenwashing part of things comes in. Um, that's where there's, um, I think, just the narrative has gone too far from reality, such as waste heat recovery, um, gas fire turbine power instead of coal or, or petroleum fired, real things, to now this other part of things where we're trying to meet these net zero targets with these really ridiculous schemes uh, that we've come up with in order to, in order to do so and it's just wasting everybody's time uh, to meet certain metrics uh, at that point and once again santos the acquisition was finalized in 2018 the field was discovered even before that and it didn't enter fid until august of 2022 you can see the delay i'm talking about here in terms of new supply coming online in a period of years so there is a massive delay. In the meantime, we haven't spent the money on exploration to do the uh, to get started on the process to begin with. So bullish in one way, we still need to watch for new supply, new exploration, and new projects coming online. Um, there's also a fight between Conoco and Santos, where Conoco wanted $95 million for road access, and Santos only wanted to pay $60 million. And they had a massive court case over it. Uh, which is kind of interesting to me that a multi hundred billions of dollars companies are fighting over effectively $30 million and would rather go to court, uh, superior court, in order to fight that. And just goes to show the competition that is in this area from restricting other people from doing their projects and you yourself taking over a larger chunk here, especially in Conoco's mind. They want to be the big producer. Here is the pickup project. You have the Kaka project and then Horseshoe, Alpine, Conoco, Greater Moose's Tooth, Conoco. Uh, we have Prudhoe Bay and Cooper Oak River. You can see some pictures here, Dead Horse, the TAP system, and then the Valdez Marine Terminal. Uh, I like pictures because it just gives people a bit more visualize as to where we are. Um, and, then, and then these are some other production units as well. Just a summary of the map once again. Here is the map the entire map. 
Pika, Koka, Horseshoe. And then these are the conical units, Beartooth, GMT. Um, I believe Colville maybe as well. And then these are some of your Hill Corp areas, Cooper Root being a conical asset. And then here is your shale oil, uh, sandstone frac slash shale oil uh, probability where, where, where some of the work is being done. Here is the exploration site, pick a C exploration drill site, fully reclaimed in 18 months. So once again, the oil industry is doing their job. And also a quick point on exploration companies, not every exploration well is produced. Very few of them end up in production. They're just there to, to appraise the asset. After that, they get abandoned, they get uh, cemented in, reclaimed, and the company figures out the proper way to produce the oil. So this was a, another narrative that got produced at one point that XYZ company didn't, didn't succeed in exploration because they had to abandon their appraisal well. Appraisal wells are usually abandoned no matter what, because they're not, they're not set up at the right place to produce them. You know, where, where are you gonna produce this oil unless you have a full field scale development in place? Um, here is some information on the logging. And once again, if you're looking for exploration companies anywhere in the world, get this information from them. See, see, have them explain it to you and see if they actually know what they're talking about or they're just a pump story here uh, that they're just trying to sell you uh, something. We have our uh, progradation, retrogradation, it just talks about how fast does the sediment accumulate compared to how fast the sea level is rising. That's what these two terms are saying. And there's one area in here with a much higher permeability. Three milli Darcy is tight rock. That is gonna be a shale or, or a frac sandstone. 368 milli Darcy, conventional field. And that's exactly what they hit here uh, in, in one of their appraisal wells. Um, this is the Nanushuk area. As I kind of previously mentioned, this is some of the uh, field. Uh, the Pika drills are, are on the eastern side of the uh, Nanushuk field. We have a unconformity that's blocking it off. And on this side is just a massive pool. Uh, the Willow Project also being in the Nanushuk uh, reservoir. Uh, on this side, they call them Brookian reservoirs. So the new developments that are happening are in the Brookian reservoirs. The older reservoirs are all clumped under non-Brookian uh, developments. And this is where the Pika is once again. Um, here is your shelf edge. We have different Nanushuks here. So, uh, sorry, Nanushuk reservoirs. We have one, we have two, and then we have three, and zero, six, all this. Effectively, this is where Pika is. In, in, in this accumulation right here, and in three accumulation, which is bounded on this side by an impermeable rock. So these two are what uh, Santos and Repsol are looking for. And that's why you have the NAN2 shelf edge, the Nanushuk 2 shelf edge, and the three shelf edge in the middle of which is this pick a field and why it occurs in this river sort of formation, because that's just how the edges here and the edges here on this side, there is a pool, but it's not fully owned by, by these guys. It's in the Alpine pool or by a different company. So they've picked this area as their pickup field. Um, and then there's these ones on this side, which are some other Nanushuk for, uh, formations that have also been produced much smaller uh, accumulations. Um, okay, so... Structural dip cross uh, cross section. It's telling you across a some sort of distance. How do the well logs look? You may have seen this very similar for Montney companies. They have this in their corporate presentations. You can see the Nanushuk three has the best net pay. So you have really good depth of reservoir and net pay of reservoir. Out here, it becomes a shale which is what creates your trap. You need an impermeable rock to create the trap for the oil. Once again, right where the seminar started, we're right back there. You gotta look at these things uh, as a investor and as a, as a engineer in a sense uh, to understand what exactly they're trying to do. 
we also have something very interesting happening in this field where the deeper you go, the heavier the oil is getting. So natural, lighter oil is always going to flow to the top. But it's just interesting that this field itself has 35 API grade oil and also 22 API grade oil. And it depends where they drill these oils as to what they're going to end up producing um, right off the bat. And as the production continues, the grades get a different price on them. So the pricing will change um, depending on what grade gets produced. But all this work should be done. If you're looking at any new exploration company, any work in a new area, look for all this work. Don't, don't, just, don't just be buying exploration companies because management went and out there and told you, oh yeah, we got this many barrels of oil in the ground. This is what it's worth. This is what we think the company's worth because of this. And then, well, bam, you got companies that are absolute junk getting valued at 500 million or a billion dollars while they don't have any data to prove exactly what they're saying. So um, for sure, uh, uh, for sure, something I see that gets brought up a lot. Uh, so, you know, exploration companies, if you want to be successful, you got to put in the work. If you just want to go throw darts and hit the odd one as like a basket, that's fine. It's up to you, your own portfolio. Who am I to tell you what to do? Uh, but I think in, in oil cycles, if you put in the work and you find the right ones and you, and you, not just find the right ones, you don't invest in the complete junk, you can definitely increase your, your returns by a factor of two or three, which could be a big, big, big dollar amount when we're talking about exploratory oil and gas, which already has a huge return profile uh, on it. So there's a comment here. I wish you'd explain this to Mike McGlone. Uh, he thinks US break even is 40, so that's where WTI is going. Um, yeah, I mean, I also wish I lived in a video game where we had infinite oil reserves that were free to explore and also a video game world where companies would, would do projects at zero NPV just because they were bored. And, and you know, they were they just said, you know, I'm, I'm not feeling very good today. I should just go and do projects at zero NPV to provide for society. Um, I mean, you know, maybe too, too many movies or too many Sims games are being played here. Uh, the real world does not operate uh, that way. So here is your net pay map. So we see how the Nanushuk 2 and 3, the area between them is where you have your highest net pay and why the reservoir is in that river sort of fashion. Uh, both 1,300 meters deep, really good compared to some of the other fields in this area. Uh, net pay, as high as 76 meters of net pay, conventional oil. Oh, absolutely crazy. Um, porosity, 20%, 25%, relatively good. Permeability, three to 500 millidarcies, relatively good. Your initial oil saturation, um, what, what is that? Water saturation, 10 to 60%. Your oil gravity, about 25 to 30 API. Nice, nice big hydrocarbon column for oil. A little gas cap on top. 15 meters provides pressure support, great. And an original oil in place of up to 10 billion barrels here. So this could end up being a very productive uh, field for, for Repsol uh, and Santos here. So top 10 US oil fields. Um, yeah, this, this is definitely an older an older table because the, the uh, Prudhoe Bay is already more than uh, 14 million uh, expected ultimate recovery at this point. So. Um, still, still a, a very nice uh, field here that could produce up to 3 billion barrels over its uh, lifespan here and why there's a pick of phase one and then a pick of phase two that will be brought online with learnings from the phase one. So this entire area has oil. You need to own the area with the highest net pay and the best economics, always. Um, doo -doo -doo. so the rest is, uh, basically going to be a summary. We talked about the, the new formation. We talked about some of the, uh, Prudhoe Bay formations down here. This is where your Alpine formation is, um, you know, pretty nice, nice little repeat of that with the ages. Uh, some of the concerns, obviously high cost environment in Alaska, 
remote environment regulations. The drilling and seismic is only allowed in the winter season, December to April. And this is one that I would tell you right here. They have two of the top two biggest onshore conventional oil fields in North America already. The source rocks supposedly contain 1.5 trillion barrels of oil in place. This is according to AAPG, Association of Petroleum Geologists. We'll see as time goes on, but this is also why the US government bought this as their national petroleum reserve, because there is some reality to this. And this is what gets me scared in a sense. It averages one well per 130 square miles when you go outside the producing units. That is nothing that the exploration that's being done in this area is pretty much a zero, as close to zero as it gets. And in a higher oil price environment, you will see some more investment happen in this area. And it it's up to us to watch that and say, okay, what new projects are being found? What are being FID'd? What is the scope on them? What is the timeline on them? And then adjust our investment accordingly. I think some of you may have realized this at this point. I'm treating my oil investments now as, as more of a cycle investment. There was a time last year I thought, I'll just make my money, leave this, exit all my plays, go into some of the junior names or, or some of the growth names and just move on. I don't think it's, it's, it's any longer the case. I really think that um, it is becoming a long-term investment. It is going to be the investment that becomes the most the most uh, impressive returns over the cycle. Uh, but also, we need to watch some of these other factors now because we're looking at it as a overall uh, investment cycle. I'm not saying you need to look at it that way. I'm just sharing my perspective. And in that, I can't be on the computer all day watching stocks, watching daily demand, watching daily supply. It's more of a thematic investment now. And, and watching the big things that matter, which is why I shared the offshore presentation last month and why I'm doing this presentation here um, today. So a couple of quick comments on the shale oil productivity here. Uh, Great Bear was the only company in 2013 that was doing any sort of shale oil exploration. They were only 20 miles south of Pump Station 1, right on the Dalton Highway. So relatively easier to explore in that area. They ended up doing a lot of work 2014 to 2020, then they changed their name to Pantheon um, since then. And effectively what they're targeting is this area here, the Al-Qaeda and the Talitha reservoirs, which the Al-Qaeda is a, is a very small reservoir, whereas the shelf, the, the, the continental shelf is a much bigger reservoir that has yet to be really fully proven out. Um, 88 Energy has also other acreages. They have Icewine, Yukon over here. They have Peregrine. Uh, a, a, a pretty massive acreage in the NPR. Uh, and there's also West Willow that Conoco has uh, discovered and whatnot. So there's a lot of stuff happening here. Not saying it's a good investment or bad investment. There's a lot of activity. You can get a lot of information if you really want to uh, on, on, on what's happening here. Um, here is a little bit more closer zoom in on the shale play. We have your uh, shelf margin delta, which is your a, a deposition of sands with high high quality petroleum in it that goes all throughout just south of Prudhoe Bay, 15, 20 miles south of Prudhoe Bay. You have a basin floor play, and then you have an al qaeda play, which is just, just in one unconformity uh, up to the north. And there's these two companies that are right now doing this. They also have 3D seismic to some extent here uh, on what they're doing. Uh, here is the, when I call the stacked pay, this is what we're talking about. We're talking about, there is still the Cooper Rook oil field here. There is other uh, SFS plays and then the, the shelf margin delta, three of them that occur here. And we don't know. We don't know what the productivity here is going to be, what the what what's going to happen here. But I do track this because A, I'm invested in one of these companies and also B, I just think shale, I really wanna be careful with shale. There is a possibility that shale someplace can be very productive if the permeability is just a little bit higher because the oil is there in the source rocks. So 
definitely tracking any sort of major shale, uh, shale or frack type of uh, unconventional oil production because it doesn't have that lag time. Not necessarily. You could produce a lot of shale oil in a short period of time, similar to a gold rush uh, sort of mentality. And the history on it, the al Qaeda one vertical well produced 100 barrels of oil per day, 35 API. The al Qaeda two horizontal, which uh, just got drilled and whose results just came out a few months ago, came in at 505 barrels per day of hydrocarbons. Some of that is NGL, about 250 is oil, 250 is, uh, is NGL. The Talitha A oil uh, well had multiple zones that they went into and each zone produced oil, which is, let's be honest, it's a frack well that produced oil from multiple zones. It is a absolute achievement that this has happened. Are the rates all that impressive? No, but for a vertical well, making 200 plus barrels per day from a vertical well from three zones that all now have a working petroleum system and oil that can be actually produced to surface is definitely something to keep in mind. And then the Theta West one well uh, made also 57 barrels of oil per day. So are the economic at $80 oil? I don't think so, but at a much higher uh, oil price, 100, 120, if these companies can prove out the economics here and the productivity, they could become some interesting um, area where shale can pick up uh, at a future point in time. We'll talk about some of the geology here. The Bakken shale, which is also a sandstone shale, is a way to kind of put it, is, is about 0.1 millidarcy of permeability. Same with the North Slope shale place. It's a sandstone shale that's a, a 0.1 um, millidarcy permeability. When I say sandstone shale, I don't mean it's a sandstone and a shale. It's a sandstone that when people talk about unconventional, they just say shale oil. So it's a, it's a shale oil type play in a sandstone, very similar to the Bakken, which has some really productive wells, um, nice porosity, nice thickness. Everything is sort of good. The expected ultimate recovery of the, of the wells, I think is a bit overdone saying that these wells are going to produce over a million barrels each. It's just too early, way too early uh, to be making those sorts of conclusions. Uh, but at some point, you know, maybe we will uh, find out a little bit more as, as the well results come out. Um, and then this is what happened in the al Qaeda 2 well, is what they're saying. They didn't drill it deep enough. They, they fracked it in the gas oil contact which is what created some of the higher gas rates. But the gas rate on the al Qaeda 2 well, despite being a frack well, is still lower than the gas oil ratio of the Prudhoe Bay field, which is a conventional field. So I would not be worried about the, the higher gas rate quite yet. It's not really a concern, especially if this is what's happened and they fracked it into the gas oil contact. Future laterals should have a lower a gas oil contact. I would not count out this play. Not saying that I would invest in any of the companies involved. I don't really care to make that point, but any shale play that can be this productive, 500 barrels of liquids out of a less than one mile lateral, one to watch for. That is more productive than a Permian well today. Uh, Permian wells will produce 1,000, 1,200 uh, barrels per day IP30 out of a two to two and a half mile lateral. So they're getting, they're getting very close to that. Uh, on the first well and possibly fracked into a gas oil contact. So if they now drill deeper and the wells come on stronger, definitely want to watch for as a, as a, as a supply investor um, moving forward. Not saying that Alaska can get to 5 million barrels of shale oil production. That's not gonna happen. Uh, but at the same time, each incremental barrel that comes online in an unconventional short-term uh, uh, format can definitely affect uh, our investments over the next couple of years or, or over the cycle uh, as it continues. Here is a picture of the 88 Energy Drill, uh, what they're doing here. So again, very remote. It's obviously not as easy as the Permian. There's obviously not as many resources out here as the Permian, uh, not as much expertise, infrastructure, uh, fracking capacity, frac sand, ease of access, whatever. So 
it's not going to be as fast as the Permian or as high as the Permian. Still something to watch. Here are some of the uh, anom anomalous fluid factor responses. Effectively, what it tells you is how much pore volume is there and possibly how much of that is hydrocarbon bearing. So we can see why they've chosen this area in Al-Qaeda and in uh, uh, where 88 Energy is active down here. The, the red means a higher anomalous fluid factor. It could be water. It could be gas. It could just be pore volume that's empty. But so far, some of the early results have been quite productive. Um, so, so definitely watching this. The nice thing is they can only drill four or five months of the year. They can only do well testing four or five months of the year. So nothing else is going to happen this season until at least next year. And then even after that, it's going to be at least another 12 months before we get any sort of real information um, as to what's going to happen here. So more information on the well. I'm not going to go through this. If somebody wants to read on this, um, this company does put out really good corporate updates where they explain some of these things. Um, just give me one second here. Another hijacker removed. Perfect. So um, just read on this a bit more as, as to what's going on with these wells. Uh, but but definitely the first Al-Qaeda 2 well production is very productive uh, for this kind of shale sandstony well. So this is what they produced, 180 oil uh, of oil, 325 of condensate and NGLs. Keep in mind, NGLs and condensate can go in the Alaskan TAP system. So just because they're NGLs, as long as they fit a vapor pressure uh, maximum, they are able to go into the TAP system. And we'll see what the results are from this SMD reservoir, the shelf margin delta reservoir, once there's some finally some results from that. Uh, over the next six to 18 months, let's say, uh, that come out. And a lot more information on this. For, for, for anybody that really wants to know about this, you can read up a lot on the well itself. And uh, I spent two or three or four days just like reading uh, uh, on this well, reading forums and message boards, trying to figure out what's happening. Uh, just because shale scares me way more than conventional oil. Any sort of massive shale that can be found is something that we've been bitten by before for six years. So one of the biggest things to watch uh, going forward. Two final slides here on the Exxon Valdez. The Exxon Valdez oil spill, a very bad time for the industry. 257,000 barrels of oil was spilled and only 17,000 was recovered. 1,300 miles of shoreline was impacted and and you can look at the amount of uh, animals that died uh, here uh, from this spill, which is why the industry has really come a long ways from then onwards, and why I do think environmental regulations should be in place up to an extent, uh, which also give our industry a better name and also restrict supply from uh, uh, coming online as fast as maybe it used to in the past. Some more pictures on the spill itself the oiled beach and the uh, birds and everything and whatnot. Um, definitely something that I don't like to promote these things, but it's something that we need to keep in mind that the oil industry has had some significant major incidents that we have now worked to fix with uh, pre-work, with reactive systems, with engineering systems, uh, with not doing projects in certain parts of the world and just, just having a better understanding of, uh, of the sensitivities of some of these areas. And with that, I will uh, leave it there. So we talked about the history, the production, current production, and then the future forecast, and why I'm so focused on this area, as in looking at what the impact of the, of the area is on the supply side going forward. And uh, I think I don't really wanna do too long of a Q&A here today, if, if at all. Um, just given that we're into this already quite a few hours. Um, but I do enjoy these new presentations that are less technical based, but more uh, thematic and mindset based. Moving forward, I have the Petro Ninja Wells update coming up next week. So we have some very interesting wells to talk about. Uh, Tamarack, Obsidian, Surge, 
some new private producers as well that are drilling some cool wells, uh, CNRL, Baytex, um, uh, some of our millions wells and whatnot. So I will I will definitely look forward to sharing more on that. And in the meantime, the recording of this will be on Twitter or on YouTube uh, as soon as possible here. And um, yeah, I think uh, I think I'm gonna keep 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 it to no Q and A today, just just because we're into this already. And um, yeah, I think I hope everybody enjoyed. And uh, I may post a presentation on the website. I'm I'm having a bit of trouble with posting the PDFs properly. They seem to get sh like like moved around where I want them, and also the PDFs are more than 25 uh, MB, so they have to be posted on as a Google Drive, uh, or on an upload platform, uh, which is causing some problems. So so I will try to get all the the PowerPoints up, including the offshore one that I promised I would get up, uh, and it's still not up. So so that one and the Alaska one, and um, yeah, hope everybody has a great rest of the weekend and we will catch you uh, next week.